Good morning, good morning, and welcome, and happy Sabbath. Good morning to everyone in the building, and good morning to my listening audience online, and happy Sabbath. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We have a beautiful day here in Huntsville, Alabama. The sun is shining. God has blessed us, and I'm just excited to be here with you this morning. Can you just pray with me? Lord, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Lord has been good to me. Yes, he has. And you know, today, I'm just excited. We talked about unrealistic faith this morning, about counting the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. And you know what? When we get to counting, you just sometimes you just have to stop counting because of all the blessings that God has bestowed on us. But we are this quarter in the Sabbath school lesson, and it's called Genesis. And we have been going through the beginning part of the book of Genesis. And I hope for you it's been good because it's been good for me. You know, Genesis is the book that lets us know how everything started, right? And with, with this book of Genesis, uh, Moses penned the words of creation the fall, and so on and so forth. But today, we're going to highlight the flood. Now, some of you might say, what does the flood have to do with me? I know the story. It's a nice narrative, not so nice at the end. But what's the implications of the flood for me? You know, the Bible is a lesson book for us. And like I, I like to tell my students, my students or my audience, you have to put the Bible in context to be able to understand the direction that it's going and what the Lord is trying to tell us. So the flood, the flood, what is the flood all about? We understand that the flood, water came, people didn't believe. But what does the flood, how do we get to this? How do we get here? So in Sabbath's lesson, it actually starts in a memory text from the New Testament. And it said, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I want you to put your mental finger on that text, and we're going to come back and visit that, okay? Because what we see now is what was then. So let's, let's operate in three areas. Let's operate in the past, the present, and the future. Now, those are the three areas that God always operates in because he's all-knowing. So he knows the future, doesn't he? And he doesn't forget, so he knows the past. But what's so awesome about him, but when you confess your sins, he forgets those. Isn't that amazing? But anyway, we're going to operate in the past, the present, and the future. Now, by the time we get to the flood, now we've kind of gone through the beginning part of Genesis. We understand creation. We understand the fall. Now we're down to the flood. It is amazing how humanity has fallen. Now, we understand by the time we get to Genesis 3, we see that there's the fall. Adam and Eve fell. By the time we get to chapter 4, Cain has killed his brother Abel. Now, do we see the progression of sin? And by the time, you know, from chat, think about it, y'all. Let's put it in context. So we get to chapter 5, there's, a, there's some of the begats. So we kind of understand who birthed who, who birthed who. And by the time we get to chapter 6, God is now regretting that he created man. Isn't that amazing? We've gone from chapter 3, the fall, and now we've gotten to chapter 6, and God is saying, I am now regretful that I have created man. We now see how sin progresses. It doesn't take its time. Like I told you before, sin came into the world full grown. Fall at the tree, the next sin we read about is murder. Full grown. And by the time we get to chapter 6, God is saying, I regret that I have created man. But here's the great thing. In that regret, there's a but. In Genesis 6, 8, it, what does it tell us? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, what does that mean for us? You know, you know, sometimes we read about spiritual titans in the Bible, and we don't think we can ascertain to that level. 
we, we might say to ourselves, ah, I, I see about Noah. I see about, you know, Moses. I see all of these prophets and what they did, but I don't think that I could get to that level. But let's look at the Bible in context. It says, Noah, what did Noah do, y'all? Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, when we find something, it's not new, right? It was already there, right? So now we've got to understand what grace is, right? So we can kind of look at the New Testament because Paul breaks it down ever so nicely. He says that where sin abounds, Grace does much more abound, right? So stay with me, y'all. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And to understand grace, grace is unmerited favor, a favor that you have been given that you don't deserve. You didn't work for this favor. So now we understand that Noah found grace, so Noah understands that he is a sinner. And where did he find this grace? In the eyes of the Lord. Ah, Paul tells us something else in Hebrews. Now looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So what Noah did is something that we have to do. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah was looking unto Jesus. Come on, y'all. Stay with me. Think about it. Context. So Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we know and understand that Noah knew he was a sinner. And then looking around at his family, because these are antediluvians. These people used 100% of their minds their bodies were not like ours because they are closer to the tree of life. So the intellect was great. So family knew family, right? So Noah is looking around at his family and understanding, hey, we are definitely going down. But you know what? God had already talked to the people uh, before uh, the flood and told them this message through Enoch, through Methuselah, this has been preached. If you keep on sinning, you're going to die. Now, we already knew the sentence of death was pronounced from the tree, right? Because in Genesis 3, Jesus told him, you're going to go back to the grave, to the ground, from the dust which you come. So we know from prophetic utterances, the people of that day already knew if you continue to sin, you're going to die. But through their obstinance, they kept on doing what they were doing. But back to what I, I'm telling you. So Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, it's amazing. And I'm talking to some of my people online. I'm talking to the people in the building. It's amazing how we expect God to do what we're supposed to do ourselves. It's amazing. You know, we, we expect that if I get baptized or if I claim Jesus as my personal uh, Lord and Savior, that this book, Genesis and Revelation, automatically gets into my heart and my mind. It's like if I hold it close enough, all of a sudden, I, I got it, Lord. I got Genesis. I, I, I got it. Okay. But does it work like that? No. <laughs> we have to study this thing, y'all. And I'm talking about Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. We've got to study this. I, I had a friend who was preparing for the bar, and he told me, he said, Malcolm, he said, what I did after I graduated, I took several months and immersed myself in the information. He said, I became the bar. So when I took the test, he said, man, I was like, boom, boom. It, it, was, it was just coming out of me. And it's amazing. We won't do the same thing for God in our relationship with him. Come on, y'all. We won't, we won't put this in us so he can talk to us. Like, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, it's just amazing. If we get to talking about the Bible, some people don't really even know where the, 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 the first book of the Bible is. First book of the Bible, right? And I'm not saying that to hurt feelings, but I'm telling you, we, we get to know real 
housewives of whatever quickly, don't we? We can, we can, we can talk about the seasons of the, of the episodes that we like to watch. We know what comes, we, all right, we know what comes on NBC, ABC, CBS at what times, don't we? This is what we, this is the information we give ourselves to. We know the lineup of things. We can talk about movies and know them for verbatim. But when it comes to the Word of God, a lot of us are at a loss. And this is a serious thing because I'm putting this message in the context. What does a flood, what, what does that mean for me? So to understand it in context, you've got to know the Word. You've got to put the Word in you. And we fall asleep on it. Isn't it amazing? Your best, the best show that you watch we can, we can be as tired as we want to be. If, it, if it's something we want to watch, we can work our way all the way through it. But if we get into this word, you know, some people will tell people, if you have insomnia, just begin to read the Bible and pray. You might not make it through both. Seriously, if you have insomnia. But that's a sad fact because this is where we should find energy this is where we shouldn't be able to sit down. This is where we, it would have us walking in circles because of goodness of God. So then the flood, we're talking about the past, the present, and the future. Now the past, the antediluvians, before the flood, the past they understood mom and dad fell to sin, right? And their present, the present time for them was good because as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the son of man. So guys, before the flood, the earth was perfect. It was still in its perfect creation. The only, thing, only place they couldn't get into was the Garden of Eden. And guess what, y'all? The Garden of Eden was still on the earth. They could, do you know there were, there were angels stationed before the garden? So you couldn't question and say, oh, there's, not, there's no angelic beings. You could take your child to the garden. You couldn't go inside, but you could still see it. So, so, so the obstinance of the antediluvians, that's the people before the flood, was great. And do you know some of them had the nerve to question God? And I'm talking about his existence, his creation power, the meaning of sin, and the implication for them. Now, now I'm talking about the past, the present, and the future. Now, Noah comes on the scene. God says he regrets creating humans. Now, he says, I'm giving them 120 years. And do you know the clock started to count down? And Noah preached, y'all. Methuselah was still alive. He actually helped him build the boat. And there were others who helped Noah build. There were others who began to turn on him that helped him as well because they heard it. They got a little bit scared. They accepted the message. But guess what? It took too long. So, 130, 120 years just took a little too long. So then they started to put the message in the back of their heads, in the back of their minds, and begin to live life like they lived it. So as in the days of Noah, so shall it be, right? So they started to live the life, marriage, indulgence. Do you know Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets said that the earth was in abundance, Food would not run out. So starvation, if you were starving, that was just by choice. She said gold and, and jewels just were all around. People built houses with these materials, trying to outdo their neighbors. Uh, 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 selfishness was there. But not to get bogged down in that, that's where they were. So Noah preached this thing for 120 years. And how many people did Noah save after 120 years? Just him and his family, eight people, out of a whole world of created beings. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. We've got to be mindful of this, y'all. Just like I said, you've got to get this in you to understand what the times are. I hope you're listening to me. So then we see the flood comes. What happens, y'all? Eight people get in the boat. And this is, all, this, is, this is what's insane. Ellen White says, as Noah preached his message, one day came that they heard animals just walking into the ark. They got a little bit scared. 
but it didn't scare him enough. Then an angel, a mighty angel, came and shut the door. Now, when the door was shut, probation closed. Now, you got to remember that because that's got something to do with us. When the door was shut, probation closed. But did the people outside the boat know it? As in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So the people outside the boat, what were they doing? Marriage, giving in marriage, partying, drinking, having a good time, and even laughing at the boat. Teasing people in the boat. Look at them. And how many days did it take before rain even dropped on the boat? Seven days. Can you imagine Noah in the boat? Well, maybe, Lord, what did we do? But after those seven days, total destruction came. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what does that mean for me? Noah preached the message of time 120 years. Guess what? We got another message of time in Daniel, 2300 days, right? So Daniel gave us a timeline that we need to follow. And in that timeline, Daniel told us that, you know what? The beginning, the call to build Jerusalem up until the 2300-day prophecy ends, then judgment will begin. And not to take too much time in that, because that's a lesson in and of itself. We march forward all the way down to 1844. And guess what, y'all? What happened in 1844? Judgment began. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So judgment started at 18, in 1844. How long has that been, y'all? That's been a long time. That's been more than 120 years. But has anything changed? Not necessarily. Have we seen humanity get worse and worse? Yes, we have. Have we gotten used to that? Yes, we have. Nothing really jars us. When we hear about another mass killing on the news, does that make us fall on our knees? We just say, I'm sorry for those people. Mm, that's pretty bad. Nothing really moves us like it should anymore. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus in Matthew 24 told us these things. He said, you know what? There are signs in the seasons that you need to watch and, and be mindful of. But guess what? The Bible has told us plainly what's going to happen. And what we know at the end of the 120 years, when that boat, when the door was shut, probation was closed. Now, is probation closed for us? Not yet. We still have time. But what we have to do is be mindful of ourselves. How can I get myself ready for the coming of the Son of Man? I've got to make a choice. The people outside the boat had to make a choice. And do you know Ellen White says, had they repented like the children or the people of Nineveh, God would have stayed the flood. He would have stayed it. But guess what? He's not going to stay his coming. Now, now I'm going to the future. He's not going to stay his second coming. You following me? Why is he not going to stay his second coming? Because he made a promise. He made a promise. And he said, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He made a promise, y'all. And when he makes those promises, his promises are true. So if you don't believe him, just go back into the word. Because he said, 120 years, I can't take it anymore. But that's, that's verse 7 in chapter 6. But in chapter 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But is that conjunction that negates the first clause. Isn't that good? So I'm, 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 God does not regret dying on the cross. Because we have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So since he died on the cross, he gave his promise. What was his promise that he gave to the disciples? He told them to go and tell, but he's coming back again. And he had to reiterate that phrase when they kept looking up. Even the angels had to turn around and say, look, fellas, the same way you see him leaving, he's coming back again. So what does that mean for us? Because as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. We don't want to be lost. We don't want to be outside of the boat. We don't want, we, do you have your ticket? Right? 
and your ticket is your choice. Isn't that amazing? Because Jesus has paid the price. Isn't that amazing? You don't even have to come up with the fare. God has paid the price. God says, you know what? It costs so much for, you, for redemption, I'm going to pay it all. And all is God himself coming down and dying on the cross. And if you can't believe that, go back in the book and learn it for yourself. Because I told you, it doesn't get inside of you by you holding it close to your chest. You got to put it in you. And, and you know what? And when we get up here like this, every preacher, every person who talks about this thing, when the Holy Spirit gets on you, you understand the shortness of time. Time is not promised. We are burying people left and right. I'm not fearful of death, but what we're fearful of, did I make my choice? Did I, did, did I redeem, am I going to be able to redeem my ticket? Because if I'm not going to be able to redeem my ticket, I'm going to be just like the tares and not the wheat. I'm going to be bound up and then burned up. So all I'm telling you is make your choice. Understand what your choice is and who can stop you from getting your ticket. And that's, that's a rhetorical question because the answer is nobody but you. You know, we can say economy is down, gas is too high. I understand that. That brings, that brings a lot of hurt, harm, economic, whatever you want to call it. But can't nobody remove you out of the presence of the Lord. Even Paul said, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God. And when I put that in my mind, when I begin to understand who I am and whose I am, I then want to redeem my ticket. I, I don't get scared at the signs of the times. The only thing that makes me fearful is knowing myself. Because Paul said, work your salvation out with fear and trembling. Now, you need to understand the context of that because the Lord has not given us the spirit of, but he's given us the power and a sound mind. And the thing about it, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize how fragile you are. The more you realize, you know what? I'm a decision away from not being able to redeem my ticket. So that's the fear because you understand that the human in you is a bad person. But what makes you good is God in your heart. And, and you know, I, I told an old preacher, I used to go by and visit him. I, I, I miss him so much, he's gone. But I told him, I said, I'm, I'm going into theology and I, and I feel a calling. And he looked at me and he didn't look away. And he said, it's not that you're good, it's just you don't want to be bad. I said, Lord, have mercy. Because there's no good thing in me, but I'm, y'all, we get so bad, we don't want that no more. And what God is doing for us is he's letting us stoop in this stew of sin so that when we get to glory, we don't want that anymore. We don't want any of it anymore. I don't know about y'all, but I'm so tired of this planet I'm so tired of me as a human being because we're sometimey, we're, we're, we're conditional, we're, we're all over the place. We can't even steady ourselves. The devil is on us. Y'all, depression and anxiety is real. We've got people wanting to kill themselves and, and do things that they don't have to do because Satan is on them. He's on us. But guess what? You know why he's on us? He doesn't want you to redeem your ticket. Because your ticket has been given to you. It's sure. It's as sure as you're standing on this carpet this morning. So what does the flood mean for me? I understand that as this progression of time comes, the end of time is coming for us. And it is as sure as the flood. Because as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Dear Lord, we thank you so much. We ask that you save us all from ourselves. Amen. Hello, Oakwood University Church family and friends. 
Welcome to This Week at the OUC. I'm Isaiah Goodridge. And I'm Simone Vaughn. We are once again so glad you've decided to join us for our worship experience. Please tell us where you're joining us from in the chat, especially if you're joining us from overseas or if it's your first time. We hope that you would be richly blessed by today's service through our preaching, teaching, music, and children's ministry. Today, Pastor W.R. Snell will continue his sermon series entitled, Get Unrealistic, with a message entitled, Is Your Preference Greater Than Your Faith? Our special music will be brought to us by the Alabama A&M Gospel Choir. Pastor Mark Raphael will also share his Oaktown Children's Ministry. Please join us in person or invite a friend to tune into the service. Join us at 5 p.m. today for our Zoom Sabbath Afterglow program as we review the Sabbath School lesson with Elder Ronald Lang. If you would like to join us, please use the meeting ID 248-004-3316 and the password is 4321. This Sabbath, April 23rd, the South Central Conference Youth Department, in conjunction with the Tennessee River Youth Federation, will be hosting activities for all children and youth, including music, prizes, and refreshments. From 3.15 p.m. to 6 p.m., adventurer age children will have outside activities on the lawn near the back of the OUC Family Life Center. From 3.15 to 5.15 p.m., teens will also have outside activities on the lawn near the back of the OUC Family Life Center. From 5.30 to 6.45 p.m. Central Standard Time, there will be an in-person and online town hall meeting in the OUC Sanctuary. Those who would like to view the town hall online may do so at the South Central Conference YouTube and Facebook page. Then at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, the South Central Conference of Seventh-day Adventists will hold another in-person and virtual town hall meeting at the Oakwood University Church in preparation for the upcoming South Central Conference constituency meeting in July. All are invited to attend, or you can join in by going to the website, www.iamsouthcentral.org and clicking on the graphic on the page. It will take you to the page that has the live stream of the meeting. And below that, you can chat with others online and share questions. You can also join the meeting and hear the proceedings at the following numbers. The call-in number 312-626-6799 or the Zoom meeting ID 960-5934-9828 with the passcode 560-599. If you have any questions, you can email communications at secsda.org. Prayer opens special treasure. And so if you would like to request special prayer, please feel free to fill out our virtual connect card by visiting OUCSDA.org forward slash connect for emergency prayer available 24 seven. Please call 256 837 1255, extension number 197. Also, please feel free to join our daily prayer call at 6 p.m. On Sundays from 9 30 to 10 a.m., the OUC prayer line will feature Mothers in Prayer, hosted by Hadassah Dalrymple. The prayer line number is 605 475 4120, and the access code number is 848 33 81 pound. The church office is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Friday from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We ask that you continue to wear a mask and maintain social distancing when visiting the church office. The Oakwood University Church Market, located in the Oakwood University Church Family Life Center, is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It will close from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. for lunch and then reopen from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. It will also be open straight through from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Friday. We invite you to stop by and pick up your vegetarian food products at a very reasonable price, as well as your Oaktown merchandise. You can also order your Oaktown gear online at OUCSDA.org forward slash shop. If you love Oaktown, rock the gear. Our Bible 101 study with Dr. Toussaint Williams will not meet this Monday, but will resume on Monday, May 2nd at 6 p.m. 
For the Zoom information, please email info at OUCSDA.org. Our next weekly food distribution will take place on Wednesday, April 27th at 11 a.m. in the Family Life Center parking lot. All are welcome to drive through to receive assistance. Tabitha's Corner, our clothing and non-food distribution center, is open on Mondays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the OUC Family Life Center. You can drop off items in good condition, as well as pick up other items that you may need. For more information, please contact the church office at 256-837-1255, extension number 100. Our virtual prayer meeting will continue Wednesday, April 27th at 7 p.m. Pastor Snell will continue to speak on the series, Get On, Realistic. Pastor Rafael and Oaktown will have a message for our children. You may join us by visiting our YouTube and Facebook media platforms. Teenage girls from the 9th to 12th grade join us every third Friday of the month from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. in room 109 of the Family Life Center for The Real. This meeting is sponsored by the OUC Adventist Youth Ministries and The Attic. You can also attend via Zoom. The meeting ID is 822-604-89620 and the passcode is 489-320. Young adults, you're invited to join us for our weekly Friday Young Adult Zoom Bible Study at 8 p.m. If you would like to join, please use the meeting ID 948-6252-9844 and the passcode is 707877. We also have a Young Adult Prayer Warriors Prayer and Pray Zoom meeting every Saturday at 6 p.m. The meeting ID is 917 9395-2065 and the passcode is 144-000. As we continue to experience grief and loss in our families and our church, the OUC Grief Support Ministry will meet virtually on the second and fourth Sundays of each month. For more information, email griefsupport at OUCSDA.org. Next Sabbath, April 30th, after our Divine Worship Experience, we'll be holding a ministry fair. This is an opportunity for those in the Huntsville area to learn about ministry opportunities at the Oakwood University Church and sign up to join a ministry. God is calling us to a greater level of service, and this is your opportunity to help and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Please remember the families who have lost loved ones during this week. We also want to remember those who are sick and shut in in our church family. Please keep them in your prayers, send them an encouraging card, or give them a telephone call to check on them. And that's all for this week at the OUC. If there are any other church events that you would like to have mentioned in this announcement segment, please feel free to email us at info at OUCSDA.org. Also, please remember to stay connected with us by visiting our website at OUCSCA.org or by following our social media platforms to know what is happening at our church. And if you want to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, you can scan the QR code on your screen or go to tinyurl.com forward slash OUC newsletter. May God continue to bless you and have a happy Sabbath. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. And, uh, yes, good, good morning. morning. And welcome to the Oakwood University Church Worship Experience. Yes, welcome. And today is the day that the Lord has made. This is a wonderful Sabbath morning. And if yes. you guys can tell, I am grinning from ear to ear. Yes. This is Malcolm Taylor, and this is my lovely wife. Hello, Nicole Taylor. Yes, Glad Nicole to Taylor. be in the house today. Yes. Are you? 
Did you have a good morning this morning? I had a wonderful morning this morning <laughs> because I woke up beside you. Oh, I love it. Amen. <laughs> yes. Unrealistic marriage, y'all. Unrealistic. So, hey, to God has been definitely good to us, and I appreciate yes. those kind words. It's making my Sabbath even better. And we hope your Sabbath is better, and we pray that you are doing well. And we have a lot of people from different places with us this yes. morning, don't we? Yes. So let's get started and, and acknowledge them. Oh, yeah. Well, I know there's a B Stewart from uh, Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Daryl uh, Alexander from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Lynette Staines, all the way from Ontario, Canada. Welcome. Yes. Good to Welcome. have you guys here this morning. Precious Jewels from Syracuse, New York. Awesome. Yes. And we also have Sabina Barnes from Trenton, New Jersey. And we also have Tabitha Tatum from Virginia. And we have Jewel Rogers from New York. And we also have Carolyn Hislop from Miami, Florida. So yes. welcome. These guys tuned in early this morning. Yes, yes. And we're so happy to have you here with us this morning. And you know, if you're with us, we ask that you invite someone else. We ask that you find a family member, friend, coworker, even if it's somebody you haven't really been talking to, but ask them to join this morning because you know what? what? We have a power pack service yes, this morning. Yes, we so do. So it's still early enough to tell your family and friends and even your neighbor or your neighborhood to join us because today Pastor Snell is going to bring a word. Yes. yes, and before that word, we also would like to acknowledge some birthdays. Oh, yes. God bless these people to be able to still see another day, and so we want to acknowledge them. We have Pamela Patterson, mm. who turned 70 years old. Joseph Champion, who turned 94 years old. Mm. And we have Ho Dr. Horace Taft, who turned 81 years old. We have Carlene Johnson. We also have Christopher Crumby. We have Avery Jacobs. And we also have Malcolm Court, Nelson Brown, E.J. Plummer, mm -hmm. Miranda Franklin, Coretta Walker, and Jacqueline Malone. Oh, awesome, awesome. Uh, and we have Carla Miner. We have Anthony Michael uh, Pinnacook, Joseph Champion, uh, a different Joseph Champion, uh, Deborah Claiborne, Leroy Hampton, uh, Janine Wright, Lisa Applewhite, Beverly yes. Hines, John Shirley, Amber Byers, Anaya Hardware, Jean Vaughn, and others. Yes. Yes. So and many. what about the birthdays today? We want to go over some yes. today. Yes. Yes. We have some birthdays today. We have Agnell Sampson. He's yes. turned 76 wow. years old 76. today. Happy birthday, Professor. And we have Autumn Alexander, uh, 23. Uh, Lanita Caldwell, 23 today. Joseph Hampton Sr. Uh, and I'm sorry, not 23, but their birthday is on the 23rd. Thank today, you. Today. Yeah, I'm making some people younger than they are. Uh, Joseph Hampton, Tashay Kemp, Abna uh, Nemhart, and Vanessa Nora. Happy birthday yes, today. Yes, happy birthday. Yes. And so while we're also celebrating birthdays, we also want to talk about those who are celebrating wedding anniversaries. Oh, yes. We know that marriage is beautiful and it also can be challenging. Yes. And so to be able to stay together for another year is such a blessing. And yes. so we have Daniel and Marie O'Boyle who are celebrating 36 years. Awesome. Congratulations. Yes. And we also have Leroy and Janoyce Hampton, yes. who are celebrating 52, 52. years. So, yes. wow, congratulations. Yes. yes, 52 years. And if we missed your birthday or anniversary, yes. please drop it in the chat and share it with us so that we can place you on our list for birthdays and anniversaries. And even our members and even non-members, feel free to send that in so we can know who you are, when your special day is, yes. so we can announce that for them. And so um, as we are wrapping up the birthdays and anniversaries, it's time to begin the service. And I know that God has given Pastor Snell another awesome word today. Mm -hmm. And so for our online viewers, please stay tuned. Yes. And share now to our baby blessing. Yes. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I just want to say to Joel and Rachel, it is my great joy to be able to share in this wonderful experience for your family as we present little Nora Mariah to the Lord. And church family, we want you to know that uh, Nora is their second miracle baby and her middle name and her first name reflects the names of her two grandmothers. And so we're grateful and thankful for how God has richly blessed this family. One of the things I just wanna to say to you before we offer up her 
in prayer, uh, in a prayer of dedication to the Lord, is that one of the things the Bible says is that there is a time and a season for us to do all things. And I think it's really appropriate for us to be aware that there is a time and a season that is dedicated to us teaching our children about Jesus. But one of the things that happens too frequently is that there are a lot of people that miss the allotted time and season. There, there are times where people think, I'm going to wait till they get 15, 16, 17, or 18 to really try to drill down and begin to cement the things of God in the life of a child. But one of the things I want you to know is that that season of instruction and cementing spiritual things doesn't begin at fifth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, or as they are en route to college. That season begins right now. While she is still moldable, pliable, and flexible, you want to make sure that even now you begin teaching the Word of God, that you labor over her constantly in prayer, that you call her name out loud before the altar each and every morning, that you even just fill up her room with the songs of Zion so that her ears have a familiarity with the things of the Spirit, that she begins to automatically drift and bend toward the things of God, and you're creating a construct where she develops an appetite for the things of God, and the things of this world begin to be a little bit more foreign to the taste. I remember one time I was getting ready to fly somewhere, and as I was, you know, seated on the plane, my you know, seat was in the up, back in lock position. My trays were up, and we were getting ready to leave. And after a while, the pilot came over and said there was going to be about a 10-minute delay. After a while, that 10-minute delay turned into 20 minutes. 20 minutes turned into 40 minutes. And I was a little bit frustrated at why it was taking us so long to take off. And eventually, the pilot came over the loudspeaker and said, listen, we apologize for the delay, but we've had some mechanical failure. And he said something I'll never forget. He says, it was important for us to deal with that issue while we were on the ground because it was no way to repair it once the plane had taken off in the air. And the same is true for our children. There are certain things, habits of character, that have to be corrected while they are young because it's nearly impossible to correct those things once they take their adult flight. And I need you to know that all of us as parents, we are imperfect. We don't always know what to do. But the promise of James is true, that if any of us lacks wisdom, let us ask of God who gives to all men freely, and he will not withhold it. And so as we present her to the Lord, I want to invite you to affirm some vows today by saying, I do or I will. As we present Nora to the Lord, do you recognize that you are not an owner, but that you are simply a steward? of her gifts, her talents, and her potential. Would you make sure that Nora meets Jesus at home? Would you teach her about Jesus within the confines of your house? And would you make sure that the things of God are reinforced at church and where possible through a Christian education? Lastly, if there were ever to be an idol in your home, or anything that would have a strong influence to remove her or draw her away from the Savior's side? Do you make a covenant to not even allow the sun to set this day before removing such a thing from your home? And to your village, to your extended family, grandparents and friends, do you make a covenant to stand with Joel and Rachel? Would you encourage little Nora with your prayers, with your words of encouragement, with your godly example? and where appropriate, your financial gifts, if you will, just say, I do. At this time, we want to offer up little Nora in a prayer of dedication to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it is with great joy that we present little Nora back to you. Lord, we give her back to you because we're asking you to do some specific things. Lord, right now, would you allow the anointing of the Holy Ghost to overshadow this young woman? 
I pray that you will carve out a life's path and journey that is unique, that is distinct, that is peculiar just for her. I pray that you would dispatch angels that excel in strength and in might to be encamped about her all the days of her life. Would you bless her in her coming out and in her going in? And Father, my prayer for her is that she would be so filled with the Holy Spirit that she would be able to be a woman of virtue, a woman who loves the things of God and has a distaste for the things of this world. And Lord, we don't just dedicate the child, we dedicate the entire family. I ask, Lord, that you would give Joel strength. Lord, I pray that you would give him spiritual courage. And Lord, I pray that you would be able to have the conviction to lead this family in the ways of righteousness. May he not bend to the trends of culture or the prevailing thought of the time, but Lord, may he fix the temperature and the tempo of the home over the immutable promises and uh, instructions that are given to us in your word. Lord, for Rachel, I pray that you would give her a strength that is inhuman. Lord, I pray that in those days where she is worn and wearied by the duties of motherhood and being a wife, I pray that she will be able to lay claim to your divine omnipotence. May she be daily strengthened. May she be daily revived. May her cup always overflow. And may she raise her children from a full cup and never from an empty cup. And Lord, my prayer today is that you would go ahead of baby Nora, that you would arrange every detail of her life. I pray that she would be able to sense when the Spirit is talking to her. I pray that she would have convictions that are non-negotiable, that are not flexible based upon any particular circumstance. And Lord, as she is raised in the house of the Lord, may her testimony be like that of David that she would want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. So, Lord, we raise up this little one to you, asking that you would keep her for your safekeeping, that you would seal her and this entire family until the day you appear. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Let God's people say together, amen. And amen. At this time, our head deaconess has some special tokens from today. We want to present to you her first little baby Bible, encouraging you even now to begin studying the Word of God aloud with her. And we also have a certificate of dedication, encouraging you to tuck it away along with pictures from today, maybe sharing it with her around her 12th birthday so that she knows that from the very start of her life, she was dedicated to God, to His cause, and to live a life that is worthy of his glory. May God richly bless you as you continue this journey together. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Welcome to the worship experience of the Oakwood University Church. Located on the campus of Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama, and the home of the Breath of Life Television Ministries. Experience worship where Christ is first. Lives are transformed. And sharing God's love flows freely. Welcome to the Oakwood University Church Worship Experience. Happy Sabbath and welcome. Let's stand to our feet and welcome this atmosphere. Come on, we can set it all together and worship. Everybody, let's say welcome. Welcome into the house of the Lord. A place where you can leave. A place where you can leave your cares behind. This morning, we invite you to come on in. Come on in and happiness you'll find. Hope for the hopeless. Hope for the Let's sing that one more time. Let's say welcome. Welcome into the house of the Lord. A place where you can find some shelter. A place where you can shelter from the rain. We beg you to look around. Look around, there's joy you can explain. Peace from the Father. Say 
Good morning. I don't know about you, but I feel excited to be in the house of the Lord. Come on, when the trials of the week get you down, you can come to the house of the Lord from some peace. Come on, Psalms 121 says, I will lift my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He will uh, keep you and will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from evil. He shall preserve your soul. So the Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in for this time forth and forevermore. Amen. 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 Let the people of God say amen and let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you are great and your mercy endures forever. God, we simply want to say thank you for this beautiful Sabbath, the Sabbath that was not guaranteed to anyone in this room. Now, Lord, as we prepare our hearts and our souls for this message, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit enter into our midst and abide with us. God, we are ready to be changed. Please change us today, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. Welcome to Oakwood University Church. You may be seated. Is there anyone here for their first time? If you want to just wave. If you're not too shy, you can stand. Let's put our hands together. You saw those who waved. Yes, welcome, 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 welcome. Any of you watching for the first time online, we want to welcome you too. We also have uh, Alabama A&M that's with us in the house. Let's put our hands together for Alabama A&M. We will hear from them later on today. Has God been good to you this week? Oh, no, I don't believe you. <laughs> Has God been good to you this week? Can we give God a hand praise? Amen. I know he has been mighty good to me. Well, we have just a few announcements. Uh, of course, we have Oakwood the uh, Oakwood at, what, what is that? Oakwood Today or Oakwood, the announcements. You know what I'm talking about, right? We have that, we have that each week. Well, this is my first time being able to give some other announcements. So today I want to announce that we have a wedding that's going to occur on April 25th. And it is Lorna Spencer and Lewis Jones who request, request the honor of your presence on April 25th 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, and it will be here in the sanctuary. They will have a reception, but because of COVID, it will actually be a private reception. But please come and support them. 
Uh, we also have Adventure Field Day that will be on Sunday, 10 to 2. They have some awesome events that are planned. We'll have the kite. And so it's so exciting. To, how many of you guys have flown a kite before? It, it's a good time, right? Make sure you bring your kite even if you're, not, if you're young at heart. And our children want to make sure that you bring a kite. Or kites, in fact, will be provided for you if you do not have one. So please make sure you come out for that. We have another item regarding our children that I will announce in just a bit. But I do want to announce some sad news. Um, Elder Joseph Griffin passed on this past Sunday, on Easter Sunday. Uh, he is the father of Hilma, uh, Dr. Hilma Griffin Watson. And we want to keep her and her family in prayer. Uh, how many of you will keep them lifted up in prayer? Amen, amen. The services will be on this Wednesday at the Royal Funeral Home at 11 o'clock. Royal Funeral Home at 11 o'clock uh, on Oakwood Avenue. And the viewing will be at 10 o'clock, so please um, be aware. And I pray that if you're able, that you will, you will come. How many of you have had family, church family, to come to your family member's funeral and it really encouraged your heart and brought comfort to you? Amen. And I know we can't always attend, uh, but let's keep them in prayer. And if we can't attend, let's please be sure to do that. We also have another service that we want to announce. Uh, we, we will have the celebration of life services for Claude Thomas Jr. Uh, those will be on, or that will be on next Friday, or this Friday coming, April 29th at 11 a.m. right here at Oakland University Church. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I'm missing. Oh, yes, today we are having the Tennessee Valley Youth Federation at 3.30 to 6.30. We'll be having a special event for our, our youth and our children. How many of our children are out there? Just raise your hand. How many children are out there? How many teens? Do we have any teens? Wonderful. Well, we have a special event for you, 3.30 to 6.30. There's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, bring your lunch and uh, a chair and, and make sure you come out. It's going to be a real good time for our kids. Uh, four years to fourth grade and then 12 years of 12th grade. Uh, and then after that, at 5.30, our teens will meet together uh, for a town hall meeting. So you, our teens will get a chance to talk about some things, learn some things that are happening in South Central Conference. And then the adults will meet at 7 o'clock. And so some of your friends who may go to another church, please come out so you can see them, but also so you can get some great information about what's going on in South Central Conference. We have some incredible and important things that we want to announce at 7 o'clock right here at Oakwood University Church. I, I think that's all that I have for announcements. There may be some more announcements that will come out later. We're so grateful that you came today. May we continue to enjoy the Lord as we worship him in spirit and in truth. You can see how often I do this, right? All right. So we do have a baptism. And... Yes, put your hands together. Amen, amen, and amen. And so we're welcoming out. We, in fact, it's so, I'm so excited. We have, we have been blessed that we had several who were getting baptized. We had Zyron who was getting baptized and his mother, Alicia. Uh, but he had an accident, so he wasn't able to be able to be in the baptism today. But God provided two others who are going to be in our baptism on today, right? Right, two others, in addition to Sherelle, who was already getting baptized today. So I'm so excited about that. So we having Sherelle first. Okay, right, there's three, right, Sherelle and then, yes.
right, so in the pool, we have Sherelle, Allison. Those of you who know Sherelle, can you please stand and want to join her in support today, if you'll please stand with her. Sherelle, it's so good to have you in the pool today. You know I love you. And I love the hugs that I get every single week. And I love that you have been someone who has served the Lord for many years. You served in our primary Sabbath school class. You have served with our community service. You recently got drafted to serve as one of our hosts and greeters and people who bring people in through registration. You check their temperatures. You make sure the kids get their programs. We thank God for your service. We know today would be just an incredible day for your mother, but we know that she always saw that you would continue to serve the Lord and that perhaps even someday you would become even more committed to Jesus. So today, we're so grateful that we get a chance to baptize you today. And so, Sherelle, because you have made a decision to make Jesus your choice, to go into the watery grave and leave your sins behind and rise up a new creature in Jesus, we as ministers of the gospel now baptize you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Be faithful in today, be faithful forever in Jesus. so excited right now we have Rachel Griffin who is in the pool Rachel we're excited if anyone here family friends if you'll please stand in support of Rachel at this time amen Rachel I saw you in the office and uh, you were dressed as if you were just ready to sit down for church today but I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit put on your heart to give your life to Jesus and so today it is our pleasure and our honor to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Be faithful now and forever. now have Michael Tao. We're so grateful to have not just women give their life to God, but men give their life to God. Can we say amen? <laughs> Praise God. Those who are, would like to stand in support of Michael Tao, family, friends, uh, we're so grateful that today is your day in Jesus, a new day, a, a new birthday. Amen. So at this time, it is our pleasure and honor as ministers of the gospel, to now baptize you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Be faithful now and forever in Jesus.
together for our praise team and our band members. I don't know about you, but I get excited when I hear that song. You get excited when you hear that song? That is an oldie but a goodie, amen? It's always so wonderful to think about being taken to the water. How many of you have been baptized? You've given your life to Jesus, amen, through water baptism. Praise the Lord. Look at that. That's beautiful. You know, we know that in every congregation, uh, by faith in God, that there's somebody who came in who has not given their life to God who have not given their life to Jesus in baptism. I, that's our prayer. Is that your prayer every week? Uh, we don't just want the saved to show up to church, amen? amen? We want those who have yet to enter into a relationship with Jesus. So if you're online or if you're here in our congregation today, we want to welcome you. We want to open the doors of the church to you. We want to invite you to give your life to Jesus. You saw three people give their life to Jesus. Today, God had a plan for you to make a decision as well. And so in your heart, you're making that decision. We won't ask you to raise your hand, but we do ask you to go online to info at OUCSDA.org. Email us at info at OUCSDA.org to let us know the decision that you've made. I just want to take a moment. Can, can those of you who have been baptized, who are saved in Jesus Christ, can you just bow your heads and just pray just for a moment as someone is making that decision online, someone is making that decision right here in the pew, right here among you. That person who has not given your life to Jesus, people are praying for you right now. Someone prayed for me. Someone prayed for those who are praying right now. We don't want to pass this moment. This is a God moment, a Holy Ghost moment. Amen. We look forward to welcoming you into our church family very soon. God bless you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of y'all came to bless a risen Savior this morning? Listen, I know that Easter is over, but the Lord is still risen today. How many of y'all know that this morning? Listen, the song is real simple. We we're paid for with a price, and the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we just came to say thank you for all that he's done for us, and we worship him this morning. It says, you thought I was worth saving, so you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping, so you cleaned me out. You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could be whole So I could tell it
have a risen Savior. He came and gave his life for us. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's stand on our feet and sing this hymn. It just says, he lives. Anybody believe he lives today? Christ Jesus lives today. Hallelujah. It just says, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. The world, today. In the world today. I know that he is living. I know that he is living. Whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I, see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice, I of hear cheer. his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him.
grows weary. I never shall despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy months, the day of His appearing. Along the narrow way. Along life's narrow way. Let's take it up. It says, Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. The hope of all who seek him. Hope of all who seek him. The help of all who come. None other is so loving. None other is so loving. So good and kind. Come on, sing it out. He lives. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He walks And talks with me. And talks with me. Along life's narrow way. Let the church say amen again. Amen, amen. You believe that Christ has risen from the grave. Say amen again. Amen, amen. Now is the time for prayer. One of my favorite writers said that prayer is the breath of the soul. It is the secret of spiritual power. If it were not for prayer, 
I would not be standing before you today. Prayer is the breath of the soul. I want you to know today that by the grace of God, no matter what you have gone through in life, that if you tie your hands to the hands of Jesus, Amen. there is nothing, nothing that God would not do for you, for his people, if you would just ask. At this time, before we go to the throne of grace, the praise team will sing a song of prayer. Come on, let's open up our mouths and sing this together. The song says, I will be with you. Trust me. Trust me. Let's sing the next part. It says, I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you. Let's trust in that promise this morning. I'll never leave you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for dispatching your only begotten son to this earth so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. And so as a result of this dispatchment, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find pardon and forgiveness of all of our sins. You said in your word that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our Father and our God, we know that the devil is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But yet, in spite of what the devil's tactics are, we know that if God be for us, who can be against us? And so, Lord, we lift up this congregation online and in our present midst. We lift them up in a special way. Help them to know, to know oh God, 
that in spite of the trials, the tribulations that they encounter in this old troubled world, that as disciples of Christ, you have promised them, lo, I will be with you even unto the end of the ages. And so, Father, we thank you for just putting up with us. We thank you for giving us another chance. And as a result of this, this chance, this, this chance, we know that you want to save us more than we want to be saved. And you want to grace us more than we want to be graced. And so, Father, now, as we look forward to the word, you said in your word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would be with Pastor Snell as he present to us wonderful words of life. And we pray that as a result of the word of God, that we will come to the realization that only what we do for Christ will last. And Father, we look forward to your coming. When you will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, bring my daughters from the ends of the earth. We pray that each and every one of us, under the sound of my voice, would be in that blood wash army when the sons and daughters of God go marching in. This is our prayer and this is our hope. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we walk back into our seats, we can count on them. Come on, all those who feel like their prayers have been answered, let's open up. Say, I am. Good morning. Good morning. Sabbath blessings to you. For our offering this morning, I'd like to share with you from the book Councils on Stewardship, chapter 13, founded upon eternal principles. And I'll be reading from the quoting, and Ellen White gives us this word. As far back as the days of Adam, God required the offerings of gifts to be used for religious purposes, even before he gave the definitive system to Moses. 
In complying with God's requirements, the people were to manifest in their offerings their appreciation of God's mercies and blessings to them. This was continued through successive generations by Abraham. Even Jacob, an exile and a penniless wanderer in Bethel, he lay down one night, solitary and alone, with a rock for his pillow. And there he promised the Lord, of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give you the tenth unto thee. She continues, God does not compel his people to give. All that they give must be voluntary. God will not have his treasury replenished with unwilling offerings. And there's even a biblical confirmation to her word, and I'm reading from 2 Corinthians 9, 7, 2 Corinthians 9 verses 7 and 8 from the New Living Translation, and it says this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As you prepare today to give God your tithe and offerings, remember the lyrics or be minded of the lyrics of an old and familiar song which says, you can't beat God giving, no matter how you try. Just as sure as you are living, there's a God in heaven on high. You know the rest. The more you give, the more he gives to you. Just keep on giving because it's really true that you can't beat God giving, no matter how hard you try. Family of God, it's certainly God is worthy of all of our gifts. He's blessed us. We're breathing and from where I stand, you all look blessed to me. So would you pray with me as we ask God to receive these gifts? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back what is rightfully yours. Help us to give cheerfully and not grudgingly. Help us to be reminded that everything that we have is because of your mercies, because of your grace, because of your generosity. Lord, may we give back to you in copious measure so that you will Open the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Bless those that have to give and those that have not. And may this offering go to the furtherance of your gospel is our prayer. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. Have a In a world day. that's constantly changing, it's a blessing and a comfort to know that God is still in control and that he is still touching the lives of people everywhere. Here at the Oakwood University Church, we are committed to reaching all people with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and responding to the needs in our community and beyond. We work diligently to ensure that you are blessed through our preaching, teaching, music, children's, youth, and community ministries. We praise God that we have been able to provide weekly food giveaways, COVID-19 testing and vaccinations, help during disasters, healthy food alternatives through our Oakwood University Church Market, our online support through Grief Share and Divorce Care Ministries, and daily prayer through our prayer ministry, just to name a few. But there is so much more that God is calling us to do and we need your help. As people return to worship in person, with your prayers and support, we can continue to create additional online content to reach people with the good news and cover the production costs associated with providing a quality, meaningful virtual worship experience. Please know that you can faithfully return your tithe and combined budget offerings in several ways. You can give in person by visiting our church office on Mondays through Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Or you can mail your gifts to the church at 5500 Adventist Boulevard, Northwest, Huntsville, Alabama, 35896. You can share your gifts online through our church website at www.oucsda.org forward slash donate. Or 
You can cash app us by utilizing our cash app handle, dollar sign OUCSDA. You can also use the Adventist Giving app and donate under Oakwood University Church. May God continue to bless you as we engage in meaningful, relevant, and life-changing ministry. Hi, I'm Kai. I'm from Maryland. And welcome to Uptown. Next up, our new team. <laughs> Kids, I'm Rilida Gay, and I'm the Oaktown News Team. Uh, and thank you, Kai, for welcoming us to Oaktown Live. Uh, now, I don't know if you noticed or not, uh, but we're starting Children's Sabbath School time again. Uh, <laughs> May 21st, to be exact. And I'm excited, because I'll be able to see kids in person. Well, well that's all for now, uh, because we want that to be on your mind. Next up, one of our neighbors singing the Oaktown song. And remember... Oakdown is indeed the place to be. I don't know if you were surprised or not, uh, but while we're waiting for kids to turn into videos, uh, I'm the next singer. <clears throat> Oakdown is the place for me. Uh, I don't know what just happened. Uh, clearly, something's wrong with the music. Uh, something's not right about it. Uh, we, we have to fix it. Uh, so we'll just move on to our birthdays uh, because it's not fair to me to get bad music. Well, kids, let's see which of our children registered in Oak Town had a birthday last week or who has a birthday today or who will have a birthday by Friday. Eva, Nyla, Aaliyah, Elena, Samuel, Christian, Caden, Riley, Giselle, Jason, MJ, Melissa, Autumn, Isaac, Jaden, Anaya, Kayla, Xavier, Jace, Carissa, Mariah, Riley, Cameron, Jael, Joel, Sydney, Maya, Aliza, Ivan, Jaden, Kaba, Unati, Violet, Isabella, Tex, Catherine. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. God has blessed you with one more happy birthday. to each of you. Praise God, God has blessed you with another one. Well, it's time for our giveaway for children registered in Oaktown. So let's see who I will pick today. And I picked Quadjo L. Congratulations, you would get your gift by email this coming week. And speaking of gifts, we will have a sermon note giveaway next Sabbath, April 30th. Please don't miss it. Unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Whoever does not pick up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 38. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Because he, he takes care of me and he gave us this beautiful house with the 
the trees and everything. I love Jesus because he died on the cross to save us from our sins. And he didn't have to do that. He did it because he loves us. Oh, Lujimi, why do you love Jesus? Ah, I love Jesus because he is my healer. He healed me and I'm here today because of Jesus. Phoenix, say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Because he loves me. He loves me. Isn't it awesome to hear our kids say what Jesus said by memorizing the scripture and also to tell us why they love Jesus. Let's put our hands together for our children. Well, kids, how many of you enjoyed Easter last week? Did you do anything special? Did you boil eggs and color them and, and hide them? Or, or, or maybe you got new clothes like my brother got me this. Did you have new clothes for church on last week? D did you uh, memorize scripture of Jesus' crucifixion? Did you celebrate Jesus' resurrection? Wonderful. Well, you know, last week we weren't, we didn't meet to get together here in Oaktown. So today we're going to celebrate Jesus' death and his resurrection. And this, and we're going to celebrate it through talking about it, through acting it out a little bit today through the last three days that we talk about as it relates to Jesus. We call it Passion Week. What do we call it? Passion Week. So since we're talking about week, let's get started. Do you know the days of the week, kids? Let's try it. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wonderful. Okay, well, that was easy. So let's see. What is the first day of the week? Do you know, kids? Oh, I heard you. It is Sunday. That's right. The first day of the week is Sunday. So there's Sunday. All right. Okay. What is the seventh day of the week? Uh-huh, I hear some different answers, kids. Uh-huh. That's okay. It's all right. It's Saturday. It's Saturday. Thanks to the parents for helping. That was good. All right. And how about the sixth day of the week? Yes. Some of y'all know that. That must be the day you get out of school to start your weekend. Very good. So those are the days of the week. So Friday during Passion Week, what happened? Do you remember what, what happened to Jesus? Jesus was hung up on the cross on the sixth day. And he died on the cross on the sixth day of Passion Week. And guess what the people did who wanted Jesus on the cross? You're not going to believe it. They went to the person who they asked to put Jesus on the cross, and they begged him to hurry up and take Jesus off the cross so they could remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's in John chapter 19. You can read it later. So, so Jesus who created the earth in six days. How many days, kids? Six days and rested on the seventh day and made the Sabbath. The one who is Lord of the Sabbath. The one who actually had just died for them. They forgot him but remembered the Sabbath. They remembered the Sabbath but they forgot the one who died for them. Children, when we look at Passion Week and when we look at any week and any day, let's always remember the Sabbath. And let's always remember Jesus who died for us and who was Lord of the Sabbath. Can you guys repeat that with me? Let's always remember the Sabbath. And let's always remember Jesus who died for us and who is Lord of the Sabbath. Thank you. So that's what happened on the sixth day of Passion Week, right? So Jesus died, was hung on the cross, died on the cross before sunset. And then guess what Jesus did on the Sabbath? Jesus rested the entire Sabbath. Jesus died. Jesus rested in the grave the entire Sabbath so we can rest in Jesus 
our entire lives. Kids, can you say that with me? Jesus rested in the grave the entire Sabbath so we can rest in Jesus our entire lives. All right, so if you're standing, go ahead and sit down. If you're sitting, then just make yourself, oh, even more comfortable. Just, oh, make yourself, oh, yes. Oh, I better not sit here too long. Okay. All right. So we can rest on the Sabbath because Jesus died on the cross and rested in the grave on Sabbath. We can rest in Jesus to supply all of our needs. Because Jesus rested in the grave on the Sabbath, we can rest in Jesus to work out our salvation. Aren't you glad about that? Jesus rested the entire Sabbath so we can rest in Jesus our entire lives. But, but, but that's not all. I'm glad the story doesn't end there, kids. Guess what Jesus did on Sunday? Jesus rose up with all power. So let's stand up again. Any kids in here? Can you stand up with me? I see. Yes, I see you. I see you, Samuel. Oh, I see you. Yes. So let's stand up because Jesus rose up and got power over death. Now, let's jump up. Let's jump up. Come on, you can, oh, yeah, you know if Pastor Rafael can jump up at his age. You know y'all better be jumping up. Come on now, don't, don't, let, don't let Pastor Rafael down. We can jump up because Jesus got power over sin. Isn't that awesome? But not only that, we can run and tell somebody else. So let's run and make disciples just like Jesus. Oh, you're not running fast enough. Oh, I don't hear any gears shifting. I don't hear any smoking. He's screeching. Come on, come on, pull it up, pull it up. If Pastor Rafael can do it, so can you. He can only do it for a little bit of time. Oh, whoo. Some of you don't know kids, but your parents are praying for Pastor Rafael. Uh-huh. They were like, okay, Pastor. Yeah, okay, that's enough. But just because Jesus died for us, we can go run and tell somebody else about Jesus. So I love Passion Week. Amen. Because it reminds us that Jesus died for us on the cross. It, for our sins. It reminds us that Jesus rested the entire Sabbath so we can rest in him our entire lives. And it reminds us that he rose again. And it reminds us that we can go run and go on missions to bring others to Jesus to make disciples of other people. Aren't you glad for Jesus and Passion Week? Let's put our hands together. Well, we're going to have prayer and then we're going to sing our mission exciting song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for Jesus' death for our sins. Thank you so much that Jesus rested in the grave on Sabbath. And thank you so much he rose on Sunday morning. Lord, we pray that you'll, we will allow Jesus to rise in our hearts every day. And that we will live lives that have power over sin. And lives that bring us to bring others and make disciples of others and make others to be disciples like Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Some search the world to find him. Some do their best to fight him. Some let him live inside them. He's Jesus Christ, the truth, the life, the mission exciting. He's fully God and fully man is true. Create us and save just me and you. He calls us to repent and let him in. Then go and make disciples just like him. Some search the world to find him. Some do their best to fight him. Some let him live inside them. He's Jesus Christ, the truth, the life, the mission exciting. He's fully God and fully man is true. Create us and save just me and you. He calls us to repent and let him in. Then go and make disciples just like him. Some search the world to find him. Some do their best to fight him. Some let him live inside them. 
He's Jesus Christ, the truth, the life, the mission exciting. He's Jesus Christ, the truth, the life, the mission exciting. He's Jesus Christ, the truth, the life, the mission exciting. Amen, amen. Let's give him a hearty amen. We are blessed today. No strangers to Huntsville, Alabama. We have the Alabama A&M Gospel Choir with us today. Let's give them an Oakwood welcome. The good friends of Oakwood College, Oakwood University. Under the direction of my brother, Brother Courtney Moore, we want to thank you, A&M, for being here with us today. We're in for a treat today. So you can worship with them. You can raise your hands. And let's give them a warm Oka welcome, the Alabama A&M Gospel Choir. Hallelujah. Can we say praise the Lord in here this morning? Can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Am I, on, am I the only one that's rejoicing this morning? He woke us up and brought us out to the house of worship one more time. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his name. We bring you greetings this morning from the Alabama a &M University, where our president is the newly elected Dr. Daniel K. Wims. On behalf of our faculty and staff, the Board of Trustees, we bring you greetings this morning. Pastor Snell, we thank you for inviting us on this morning. Amen. We just come to praise God. Amen. Is that all right? Amen. The Bible declares that let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And I think we all in here, we are moving. We have a little breath in our body, amen. The choir will come to you with an A and B selection. I made it, and let the Lord minister to you, amen. your hands together.
trial and every test, oh, I made it. Hallelujah.
Jesus. We can't make it without you, Lord. to us. I gotta have you, Lord. I gotta to have you, Lord. I can't make you, Lord. Oh, if you need to know, God. Tell you that if you get in, get in the spirit, let the Lord say yes. Let's give the Alabama a and Choir under the direction of Dr. Courtney Moore. Let's give them a good hearty amen. We thank them so much for taking time out of their schedules to come and minister to us in song today. And I'm thankful for the message in song. Anybody glad you made it like they sang today? There are some who didn't make it, but I thank God that we are amongst those that have made it through. Amen, amen. If God has been good, won't you say amen one more time? No, no, I didn't hear you. If he has been good, let me hear you say amen. If he's been real good, you ought to shout hallelujah. If you love him, say thank you, Jesus. And if you're glad he's coming again, let's put our hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords, giving his name the praise that it deserves. We are thankful once again for the opportunity to worship God in spirit and in truth. I want to jump quickly into the word. Before I do that, there are just a few things I want to just really impress upon us on next Sabbath. Next Sabbath, at the conclusion of service, we're going to be hosting a ministry fair. So for all of our ministry leaders, they'll be present and accounted for. They're going to have booths set up around the perimeter of the church. And I know a number of us have been asking questions about how I can get in, how can you get involved? How can you become active in service? Who is the leader of said ministry? So all around the hallways, there's going to be various booths set up. So those who are looking to get active and engaged in ministry, I want you to make sure that you don't watch online next week. You come into the building, and at the end of the service, you can connect with a ministry leader that's going to help facilitate your transition into the work of the Lord. And then, as was stated earlier, I hope some of us did not miss that. It may apply to more of us who are watching at home on May the 21st. We're going to begin our in-person Sabbath school for our children. Can you say amen? And I want you to know that Pastor Raphael and I, we've been talking and daydreaming and sharing. And if you think the children's story is good, I want you to know that your little ones haven't seen anything yet. 
And so I want to encourage all of our parents to begin making provision and making plans to join us in person starting May the 21st, where our little ones will be in the Family Life Center, where there's going to be a special program that's going to minister directly to their child experience. And also, on a great note, we want to just celebrate a great occasion that's going to take place this Monday here in the Oakwood University Church. I want to, uh, I want to celebrate and thank God that there's going to be a wedding. Can you say amen? And so I want to invite uh, Brother Lewis Jones and well, his fiance. she stepped out. But go ahead and stand up. Lewis is getting married this coming Monday here at the church, and we thank God for how the Lord has blessed him. We rejoice with you. And we pray God's richest blessing as you begin this new chapter of your journey. And then we just want to take a moment to acknowledge anybody who is with us here at Oakwood for the very first time. Or maybe you're visiting from out of town. Do me a favor, just raise your hand so we can see you this weekend. See a number of guests all across the sanctuary. Let's give them a hearty well, uh, for, uh, Oakwood welcome. If you're close to them, just tap them on the shoulder. Let them know we're glad to have you with us today. And I'm thankful to see my auntie, Dr. Kim, visiting from Detroit. Glad to have you in the house today. Today, we want to go ahead and jump right on into the Word. I want to invite you to stand to your feet as we continue in our series, Get Unrealistic. Uh, anybody unrealistic yet? Amen. Amen. I see one or two unrealistic folk in the building. We're going to continue with our declaration uh, that we make each and every week. And they're going to put that on the screen, and we're going to repeat that together. Today... I recognize that my faith is greater than my reality. I refute the ordinary because I was created for the extraordinary. I will not allow what I see to determine what I believe. What I believe will determine what I see. I will pray unrealistic prayers, embrace unrealistic vision, begin unrealistic pursuit, and maintain unrealistic expectations. I will live by faith and not feelings. I will live by faith and not facts. I will live by faith and not common sense. Faith won't allow me to be realistic, afraid, comfortable, or limited. I am proud to say that I am unapologetically unrealistic. Turn to your neighbor, give him a fist bump, and just say, get unreal, get unreal. Amen, turn to the other neighbor and say, don't be too realistic. Amen, amen. I want to invite you, friends of mine, while you're standing today, to go with me two places in the scripture. I want to begin at Isaiah chapter 55, and we're going to begin together at verse number 8. And then I want you to, while you're turning, put your finger over in 2 Kings chapter 5. We're beginning today at Isaiah chapter 55, and we're looking together at verse number 8. When you get there, just say Amen. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 8. And also we just ask that you would pray for our students. This is their last Sabbath here with us in school. In fact, they are having a separate student service over in the skating ring today uh, before they depart in celebration of their seniors under the direction of the Office of Spiritual Life. So keep all of our students in your prayers today as many of them will be transitioned and a number will be graduating as well. Isaiah 55 and verse number 8. When you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm here. The Bible says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, that's just a framework, but go ahead and turn quickly over to the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, and we'll begin together at verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter 5, and verse number 1, when you get there, just say amen. 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to begin together at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, that he was great, an honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back, a cap brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. 
and she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus uh, said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive? That this man sends a man to, uh, to me to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent the king to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abna and Pharpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. But I want to read emphasis, verse 13, the Bible says, And his serpent came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says unto you, wash and be clean? Today, saints, I want to talk to you under the subject. In fact, it is a question. And the question for us to consider, those in the building and those at home, is your preference greater than your faith? Is your preference greater than your faith? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the visitation of the spirit that is present. But Lord, I am praying that you would multiply yourself in this space. Lord, I'm praying that in the hearing of the word that faith would be multiplied exponentially. And Father, there are times where we are waiting on you to do something. But sometimes in our humanity, we try to dictate the way it needs to be done. So Lord, would you help us to humble ourselves, to be still and wait upon you. So Father, would you once again hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. Rain down upon us, we ask, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Let them that believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, for those online, be an electronic evangelist, an Apple apostle, like and share this word for those who are with us online. Again, the question is, is your preference greater than your faith? Today, saints, I want to talk to you about the danger of establishing a preference that's too rigid. 
And I want to be clear that I don't think there's anything wrong with having a preference. In fact, all of us have a preference about something, myself included. Um, I have preferences about things. Um, you know, I'm one of those people where, you know, I have a preference for Chipotle above Taco Bell. My Caribbean friends, I have a preference for grits over cream of wheat. When it comes down to ball, I have a preference for LeBron over Kobe or Michael Jordan. <laughs> when it comes down to devices, I have a preference for Apple above Android or PC devices. And like we said, having a preference doesn't make you right or wrong. It's not evil or bad. But when it comes down to faith, sometimes your preference can make you limited. You see, the word preference is defined as to prefer one thing or the other. But often what we prefer is based upon something we've already experienced in the past. In fact, if we were to break up the word preference into two parts, it would read like this, pre-reference. So that sometimes what we prefer is simply a reference to something we've experienced in the past. So that sometimes what we want in the future is a reference to something that's already happened on yesterday. And sometimes our hopes for tomorrow are based upon our experiences from a dead yesterday. And herein lies the conflict because often we're praying for God to do a new thing, but we're often loyal to our familiar thing. And so you have a preference for a certain type of man, but that preference is based upon a relationship that ended a long time ago. You have a preference for a certain type of woman, but that preference is based upon the woman that broke your heart. In fact, some of us have a preference that's attached to dysfunction. Some of us have a preference for a certain type of house, but it's based upon a house that we've already seen. We have a preference for a type of car, but it's based upon a car that we've already had to drive. And see, we're talking about having unrealistic faith, but I need you to know that you can't have an unrealistic experience if your loyalty is to your previous experience. You see, how many of us know that faith is open-minded? that faith is somewhat experimental. I love what Ephesians 3.20 says. It says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or think. But the problem with your preference, it is based upon what you can already imagine and it's based upon how you already do think. And how many of us understand that I'm at a place where I'm done referencing my past experiences in order to form an expectation about my future experience? Is there anybody that knows that what God has planned for you is greater than the highest plans you've ever created for yourself? In other words, I need you to get that limited faith is loyal to your preference, but unrealistic faith says, Lord, I have my preference, but I'm willing to let you override it. In other words, faith says, I, my preference is to have it now, but I'm willing, Lord, to wait until it comes to pass. Faith lady says, I, my preference is tall, dark, and handsome, but you'll rejoice if God gives you short, smart, and anointed. You may have a preference for a particular career, but faith says, I'll obey the calling you place on my life. See, how many of us know that too often we want a copied experience, but God wants to give you a custom experience. 
Oh, okay, let me say it this way. See, I need you to understand, church, that when it comes down to dress, I'm, I'm kind of simple. I'm not very fancy in my dress. But recently, I sat down with a tailor, and he was trying to encourage me about the need to get custom garments. And he says, Pastor, you need to not just buy off the rack because that's just cre uh, created for the general public. You need something that's been customized to your shape. And, and what he did was he took some measurements and I didn't realize he put the tape around my calves and I didn't realize that my right calf is bigger than my left calf. He uh, began to measure my arms and one of my arms is actually longer than the next and then he looked at my shoulders and one of my shoulders tends to hang down and the other one is up and he says when you get something made for somebody else it'll never fit on you like it should but I'm going to customize something for you in a way that it's it's going to accent your imperfections and it's going to hide your defects. In fact, it won't fit on nobody else because it's been customized just for you. First Kings chapter one, second Kings chapter five, and we're going to look together at verse number one, second Kings chapter five and verse one. When you get back there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He also was a mighty man of valor, but he was also a leper. Now see, friends of mine, I need you to get that chapter verse one and two. Those verses are written with a literary intentionality. I need you to get that the Bible describes Naaman as the, the commander of the Syrian army. The Bible says that he has favor in the eyes of his king. The Bible says that the Lord is with him in battle. The Bible says that he is a man of valor, but the scripture lets us know it's all nullified by the fact that Naaman has been diagnosed with leprosy. In other words, I need you to get that the author creates this literary ascent that is based upon his earthly accomplishments. He is a man of valor. He is a person of war. The Lord is with him, but all of that is nullified by the disease that has taken hold of him. Are you with me today, saints? And see, I need you to know, beloved, that the story of Naaman is literally designed to drive the coveting spirit out of the body of Christ. Now, see, I need us to get that for his time, Naaman was that dude. See, Naaman is the rare person, friends, that has the respect of those that report to him, along with the admiration of the king that he reports to. You see, Naaman is physically imposing. He is intellectually astute. And when it comes down to matters of battle, he is undefeated in his journey. I need you to get that the Bible says that the less earned in the field of battle. And understand that Naaman is the desire of most women. He is the envy of most men. And even though he is admired, and even though he has money, and even though he has power. It is all negated by the fact that Laman has been diagnosed with the disease of leprosy. In other words, Naaman is about to experience a radical shift in his life. In other words, you realize that everybody wants to be like Naaman. They want to be close to Naaman. They want to be down with Naaman until the word gets out that this contagious skin disease is crawling across his flesh. And it's crazy because Naaman is one of those people that has everything except his health. And see, Naaman is designed to teach us that number one, there is nobody that has everything. See, see I need us to understand that, that what makes life fair is that it's unfair to everybody. Do you realize that there is no amount of money that can keep you from criticism? 
There is no job that can make everyone like you. There is no job that can keep sickness from touching your body. And it's amazing that we look at certain people and we think that we want the things that they have, but everybody wants to be what Naaman is, but they don't want the disease that he carries. But the problem with people that covet is they only covet sections of your life. They only covet portions of someone's life. They only covet slivers of their life. But I need you to know that if you're going to covet somebody's good, you've got to also be willing to entertain their bad as well. You see, sometimes, friends of mine, we covet what a person has become, but we want to avoid the circumstances that made them what they became. See, sometimes you've got to realize that you don't know what a person is dealing with. You don't know what type of medicine they have to take. You don't know what the doctor told them last week. You don't know how many tears they've had to cry at night. Everybody looks happily married on their vacation pictures that they post on social media. But you never know what's happening behind closed doors. And see, what Naaman teaches us, friends, is that there is no one that has everything. In other words, the people look at Naaman, they're like, man, I wish I could be like Naaman. Naaman's got money, and he's got career, and he's got status. He's got respect. And it's crazy because Naaman has everything except for his health. And it's crazy because there is somebody that's looking at Naaman uh, with a jealous eye before, but once that leprosy crawls across this body, they get to a place where they say, well, well, I thought I want what he had, but at least I'll thank God for my health. It's crazy because when we look at some of the fallen legends of our time, when you look at the Whitney Houstons or the Michael Jacksons, they had all the money, they had the prestige, they had the power, they had everything but the peace that God uses to rock you to bed every night. It's crazy, I was in the barbershop with some young cats and they were admiring this guy Eric Benet because of all of the women that he has dated. They begin to envy the fact that he dated Mariah Carey and Holly Berry and this girl and that and they thought that his life was something to be aspired to. And I asked them the question, I said maybe the reason he keeps going through all those women is because he hadn't found the right one. See the Bible says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor with the Lord. And see, what this story is teaching us is that there is nobody that has everything. See, there are some that have everything but their health. There are some that have everything but their peace. There are some that have everything but some friends. There are some that have everything but Jesus. And what I'm saying to the church today is that unrealistic faith is not just believing for something that you don't have, but it's learning how to celebrate the things that you already have. In other words, I'm not just waiting on something that is not yet. Is there anybody that's learned how to praise God for the present blessings that are already at work in your life? Are y'all hearing me today, saints? See, see, I'm at this place, friends of mine, where my praise doesn't need a praise team. Uh, I'm just out of state, man, and, and my, I, sometimes I wake up and I just say, Lord, I thank you for my health. Listen, I'm in the hospitals enough where I thank God specifically. I say, Lord, I thank you that a machine is not breathing for me. Lord, I thank you that I can go to the bathroom without a catheter. Lord, I thank you that I can feed myself. Lord, I thank you that I can walk around and not be wheeled around. Lord, Lord, I thank you that when I open up my eyes, I can see. Lord, I thank you that when you said amen, I could hear it. Lord, I thank you that when I tell my arm to move, it moves. Lord, I thank you that there is clapping in my hands and movement in my feet and shout of praise in my belly. I thank you that there is no oxygen tank on my arm. It is why the psalmist says, let everything that has breath praise the name of the Lord. Are y'all hearing me today? Oh, Lord. 
See, sometimes I wake up and I just say, Lord, I thank you for my peace. Is there anybody grateful for the peace that you have? Uh, anybody thankful for your mental health? Lord, Lord, I thank you that the only voice I hear in my head is the Holy Ghost. Oh, y'all not with me today. Is there anybody thankful that you may have fallen out with some folk, but can you praise them? You got at least one friend. Can you praise them if your parents are still alive? Can you praise them if your wife hadn't left you? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? And sometimes I just wake up and say, Lord, I thank you for Jesus. Oh, y'all not with me. Sometimes I just say, Lord, I thank you that I know where my help comes from. Lord, I thank you that I know how to get a prayer through. Lord, I thank you that my sins have been forgiven. Lord, I thank you that my iniquities have been blotted out. Lord, I thank you that I've been numbered with the redeemed. And is there anybody that's going to stop focusing on what you don't have, but count your blessings and celebrate what you do have because you've got a lot to be thankful for. Are you hearing me today, saints? Second thing this story teaches us, saints, is it teaches us to treat everybody you come in contact with, with dignity. You know, if they were to develop a cast for the movie of Damon, so that the credits rolled at the end of the movie, they would probably have Naaman as the leading man, his wife as the leading woman, they would probably put Elisha and the king of Israel in supporter's role. But way down in the extras, you would have this little servant girl that told Naaman about the prophet. And even though she would be way down in the credits, you realize that this miracle of faith does not happen without her testimony. You see, the Syrians, what would happen is they would go on raids through the land of Israel and Samaria. And what they would do is they would plunder goods and they would also traffic people and they would bring them back and sell them as slaves. And so it stands to reason that this young girl was stripped away from her homeland against her will or her volition. And she is auctioned off and sold as a slave in the home to serve uh, Naaman wife. And it's amazing, friends, because in the daily dispatch of her duties, she is in a position to observe some things. As she observes when she goes in with the laundry, as she comes in with the food, in her duties to clean the house, she is able to notice the grief of the woman of her home as Le Naaman's leprosy can no longer be contained with his armor. It is beginning to crawl down his arms and down his limbs and up and down his neck. And there is an impending sense of death that is upon the house. And see, I need us to understand that I cannot say for certain what the relationship was between Naaman's wife and the little girl. But what scholars suggest is that even though she was a slave, and see, what I want to just say really quickly, friends of mine, is the reason you ought to treat everybody well is because you never know who's going to have to help you in your time of need. Now, let me be careful. I'm not saying that you ought to treat people nice so that they can do something for you. But what I am saying, friends of mine, is that life can be so volatile, it can be so unstable, that you never know who you're going to have to depend on to help you somewhere down the line. See, the problem with some of us, as soon as we walk across a bridge, we burn it down. Never assuming we're going to have to go back across that bridge archy in our mind. And that's what dictates whom we show deference to. And what I'm saying to us, beloved, is that sometimes it's not the important folk that are going to be the ones to bless you and help you. Am I telling the truth today, saints? 
See, I need you to understand that like the servant girl, sometimes God puts some anonymous people that you never could have picked out of a lineup to providentially be the one that is going to bless and increase your life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? Let me just say to every student in this place, be careful how you treat these gray-haired saints in this room. Because I need you to know that there are some of those that are carrying some liberal checkbooks and they are looking for somebody to bless at the end of each semester and they've got refrigerators good of good, full of good food. Are y'all hearing me today? In other words, when I go to a hotel, I'm not just nice to the manager at the desk. I'm going to show some love to the one that's cleaning the room, the ones that's serving the food, the one that's going to be cleaning near your toothbrush. Come on and act like y'all know what I'm talking about today. In other words, when you go to the hospital, don't just show manners when the doctor moves in. Man, you better be kind to the one that's cleaning the room and bringing your food and the nurse that's taking your blood pressure because those are going to be the ones that determine the quality of your stay. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, saints? In other words, when you go into the office, don't be just be nice to the boss. You better treat the office manager good because you will never see the boss. If you mistreat the office manager. But the larger point I want to say quickly is this, is that every person has intrinsic value. Every person deserves dignity. Every person deserves respect. Every person deserves a certain amount of love from a child of God. That's why in the book of James, it says that God is no respecter of persons, and neither should we. And let me be clear. When I say I'm not a respecter of persons, I respect your position. But what I'm ultimately saying is I realize that everybody has value. Everybody has love. Everybody needs friendship that I don't show more love to one than the other. Do you realize that Jesus didn't spill more blood on somebody with a PhD than he did for somebody who ain't got no education? And so what I'm saying, if Jesus paid the same price for all, Maybe I ought to show the same respect for all, the same kindness to all, and the same love for all of God's children. Are y'all with me today? So, so go with me quickly to, to verse number three. I, I'm, I'm going to move through this. I'm going to say in a hurry, but that's not true. <laughs> Second Kings chapter five and verse three. When you get there, say amen for me real quick. <laughs> Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in where? Samaria. For he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a, a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Okay. So this story teaches us some things. Now, again, I said it's not wrong to have a preference. But see, you got to be careful about how you apply that preference because if your preference is too strong, it will lead you away from your source. You see, there's a fundamental idea that you've got to digest as we look at the story of the healing of Naaman. And the idea is found in what we read in Isaiah chapter 55, where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. And as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. Are y'all hearing me, church? And he says, my ways are above your ways. 
Now, the reason that's critical, saints, is because God looks at the world from a different vantage point. God is never going to do a thing the way you think it ought to be done. And see, this is why you've got to monitor your preference because your preference, if you're not careful, will lead you away from your source. What are you talking about, Pastor? Notice what we just read when we looked at the Scripture. What did the little girl tell Naaman? She says, if you go see the prophet in Israel, he will heal you of your leprosy. But by the time he dialogues this thing out with the king, he doesn't go and see the man of God. He makes a beeline to see the king of Israel who is so shaken because he has no power to accomplish what has been requested. And, and it's crazy, saints. You see, the problem with Naaman is he doesn't want a healing that's spiritual. He wants something a little more transactional. So what do they do? So, so, so they load Naaman up. This is good, saints. And I don't want to stay here too long, but something just, it just hit me beautifully. So they load Naaman up with some silver and, and some shekels of gold and, and 10 very sharp Syrian outfits to present as an offering to the king of Israel. Now, now, I need you to know that even the offering that is presented, it reveals the greatness of the love of God. So he sends him silver, and he sends him gold, and he sends some outfits, and he says, I'm going to bargain with those in order to save Naaman's life. Now, I need you to understand that the king doesn't empty the vault for Naaman. He sends a limited supply for Naaman. So if the king of Israel says, this isn't going to cut it, then Naaman is going to have to feel the rest of the debt himself. Oh, y'all didn't get it. If the offering is not enough, then guess what? Naaman is going to die. Because what the king says is that I can't empty my vault for you. I can't give everything for you. I can only give a limited supply in order to save you. Is there anybody that's thankful that when our king saw a need to save our lives, that he didn't send a limited supply? Oh, but I rejoice today that our king emptied the vault he didn't leave nothing in savings. He didn't say, I need to keep something for next week. But he gave the best gift to make sure that the ransom would be paid. Is there anybody that's thankful that our king didn't send an offering, but our king became the offering? For he that knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Naaman's king gave a number that could be quantified, but our king paid a price that could not be counted, for we were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And see, and that's why Romans 5 says that if he gave us his son, won't he also give us all things? And that's why faith doesn't begin at your bank account. It begins at the cross because of what he already gave. So if he paid your sin debt, won't he pay your school debt? If he paid your sin price, won't he pay the price on your car? In other words, I don't have to worry about what he's going to give. All I got to do is reflect on what he already gave. And because he emptied the vault, I know that there is no good thing that he will withhold from his children. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? So, Naaman... <laughs> and his crew, 
They roll into the king's palace with military formalism and pageantry. Are you hearing me? And, and this thing has a stately element to it. In one bag, he's got silver, and the other bag, he's got gold, and, and then he's got a bunch of nice outfits. And see, I need you to understand what is happening here. See, see God told him to go and see the prophet. His source of healing is going to be spiritual. But see, the problem is he wants a healing that is transactional. See, see, Naaman wants to see what he's done is he's referred to the previous experience. See, how this is normally supposed to do is you set up a bargain. He wants to barter for his own life. In other words, he wants to be a part of a transaction. He wants to be a part of the exchange. And it's crazy because, like, they come, I mean, the king is glad for the silver. He's turned up about the goal. He's on, he's on fleek with the outfits. I looked that up. <laughs> but he is shocked out of his mind when he reads the requirements. Why? Because he does not have the capacity to do what the king of Syria is requesting him to do. And see, the problem is not with the king's impotence. The problem is that Naaman's preference has led him away from his source. And see, sometimes, friends of mine, our rigid preference will lead us away from the source or the format that God wants to use to bless us. And see, the problem is our preference is for God to do it in a particular way. But sometimes providence demands that God do it in another way. And see, the problem with our preference is that our preference is just based upon our need, but God's process is designed to facilitate your salvation. So some of us are so loyal to our preference that we will forfeit the miracle source. So God has said to somebody, you're going to find your spouse in church, but your preference is to look for them online. God has said to somebody, your calling is this, but your preference is in another career. God has said, my call for you is to gather in person in my name, but your preference has become to stay home and watch on the internet. God has called some of us to come down and be baptized, but your preference is to come down and ask for special prayer. For some of us, our destiny is going to be here at Oakwood University, but your preference is to follow the crowd into a state school. And what the story of Naaman teaches us is that sometimes it's possible to preference your way right outside of the miracle that God has in store for your life. And see, this is a crazy question because people ask me all the time. They say, Pastor, why doesn't God do miracles in the way that he used to do miracles? Why isn't God willing to do supernatural acts anymore? And the question I'm asking for the church, is there a lack of willingness on God's behalf? Or is there a lack of obedience on our behalf? Is the issue that God has closed his hands? Or is the problem that we have closed our ears so that when God says go here to be blessed we go here because it aligns with our preference are you hearing me today saints so the word says here in verse number nine y'all tired church the Bible says then Naaman went to the with his horses and chariot and he stood at the door of Elisha's house and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and be clean. And watch this. Y'all with me? Stay in the word. The Bible says, listen, please, saints, don't miss it. Naaman became furious and he went away. 
And indeed, he said to himself, he said, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand all over the place and heal me of my leprosy. Are not the Abna and Fairpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And watch this, the Bible says, so he turned. No, wait a church at. He turned and went away in rage. No, Naaman, Naaman was about to bounce. Did y'all catch this church? Now, now, the last thing I need you to understand, fourth thing, it's okay to form an expectation that God is going to do it, but you should not try to predict how God is going to do it. Okay, okay. So, I need y'all to get that this whole thing is very bothersome to Naaman. This, this is not how he saw this thing going down. I want to be clear that God, through the prophet Elijah, he does this in a way to drive all the hubris. He does it in a way to drive all the pride he does this in a way to drive all the arrogance out of Naaman because what God is after is not a restoration of body. What God is trying to facilitate is a regeneration of his soul. So this is a whole process of Naaman having to lower himself. So like I said, remember... Your boy Naaman, he, he didn't want a spiritual healing. He wanted a municipal healing. He wanted a civil healing. But everything that's a part of this process requires him to lower himself. So he wanted to interact with the king. But you remember now, Naaman is pagan in his beliefs and he is elitist in his thinking. So understand that he looks on a prophet the same way you and I look on a fortune teller. I think. <laughs> Some of y'all looking like, what you mean? I saw one last week. <laughs> but in order to move from the, the king to going to the prophet, he's got to lower himself. The prophet doesn't come to the royal court. He's got to go to the prophet his house. And again, he's got to lower himself. And when he shows up at the prophet's house, Naaman is used to people coming out and bowing down and kneeling to him. But now Naaman has to climb down off of his exalted steed and physically he has to lower himself. He's used to people coming out and saluting him. Yes, sir, and no, sir. But now he's got to go hat in hand, and he's got to knock on the prophet's door. And understand that the prophet is so disrespectful. He shows no deference for his badges, his citations, his accommodations. He doesn't even go out and talk to him in person. He just sends out a servant to go and tell Naaman, wash in the Jordan seven times and watch this church the word says that he became furious but i need you to think about why he gets so mad he doesn't get mad because the prophet said no he doesn't get mad because the prophet said i won't do it he doesn't get the mad because the prophet says i ain't got nothing for you See, I would be mad if the prophet said, man, you go somewhere else. I would be in a rage if the prophet said, I can't do nothing for you. I would be mad if the prophet said, come back tomorrow. But the reason Naaman gets upset is simply because he had a preference for how it was going to be done. And the way it was going to be done did not align with his preference. See, Naaman had created this rigid, detailed narrative in his mind 
about how God was supposed to do this thing. First, he had a primary preference that he was going to go and he was going to engage in a trade and barter, a buy and sell with the king. But when that doesn't happen, he develops a secondary preference that when I get to the prophet's house, he articulates it with his voice that he's going to come out to me. He literally has this scenario in his mind where I'm going to go into the prophet's house. I'm going to sit across from him on his dinner table. I'm going to lavish him with gifts and clothes. We're going to drink a few glasses of wine. I'm going to charm him with some of my war stories. I'm going to impress him with one of my exploits in battle. And once we begin to function like peers, he's going to come out and he's going to wave his hands. He's going to do a little dance. He's going to say a little prayer. And all of a sudden, I'm going to get better. He even then develops a third preference when he says, go wash in the Jordan. He says, listen, aren't the rivers in Damascus better than the Jordan? And it's crazy the reason he wants those rivers is not just because they're cleaner. I learned that around the rivers uh, in, in Damascus, the Abnar and the Fairpah, they literally have gardens that were erected in the image of the foreign gods that Naaman was used to. And what God is setting up, friends, he's setting up a situation where this healing is not going to be a result of his skill. It ain't going to be about his bargaining power. God is not going to do it in a way where where Baal or Astoreth can get the glory. God is going to do it in such a way that when Naaman gets his healing, the only thing he'll be able to say is that if it had not been for the Lord who is on my side, there would be nothing I could do. Are y'all hearing me, saints? So God says, I'm not going to let it be with your bargaining. I'm not going to be about, let it be about your gifts. Why? Because the one thing God will never share is his glory. Ooh, way the church at today. See, I need you to understand that God will share everything with mankind except the glory. Oh, where y'all at? He'll share his provision. He'll share his protection. He'll share his spirit. He'll send his son. But the one thing he'll never give is he'll never give the glory to your situation. He'll never give the glory to your skill. He says all the glory has to belong to me. And the reason that God will never share the glory is he wants you to have the testimony of Vashon Mitchell that says I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Look high and low. Still couldn't find nobody. He wants you to say there's nobody greater. I said nobody greater. There's nobody greater than him. And the reason he doesn't share the glory is that the glory is a compass and a directional sign for salvation. So whoever gets the glory, the assumption is that's the one that saves. So he says, your bargaining can't get the glory or you'll think your bargaining can save you. The, the pools in uh, Damascus can't get the glory or you'll think they saved you. Your garments and your gifts can't get the glory or you'll think they saved you. But God is saying, I'm going to do it in a way that doesn't facilitate your ego. It's not going to allow you to be impressed with yourself. You're not going to be able to pat yourself on the back. But is there anybody that's not have a preference about how God does it? But you want to say like the old song, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Do I have seven cents? That'll say any way you heal me, I'll be satisfied. Any way you employ me, I'll be satisfied. Any way you get me married, I'll be satisfied. However you save my children, I'll be satisfied. However you send the Holy Ghost, I'll be satisfied. I'm throwing away my preference. I'm balling up my narrative. God, however you do it, I'll be satisfied. And you know, saints, you know why some of us don't get no miracles? It's because we ain't desperate enough. What you mean, pastor? Like, 
No, I'm beside myself reading. Like, I've read the story a hundred times. But like, it's just, your boy Naaman. See, if, if the first star of the story was the little girl, the other star of the story was the servant that kept Naaman from walking away. Your boy Naaman was like, I'm out. He just did like this to his miracle. He, he's like, I'm out of here. But thank God for the servant that said, boy, what's wrong with you? You acting like you got another option. You acting like you got another choice. And see, the reason we won't persevere is we still got some other options that have got to be exhausting. You've got some other things that have got to collapse. You've got some other things you're dependent on that have got to fail you. So when they fail, when those friends betray you, when those folks ain't there for you, it is in the faultiness of man that you come to know the faithfulness of God. See, we ain't desperate enough. So that if you only pray five minutes and it don't happen in them five minutes and you go to something, it's because you ain't desperate enough. If you only give a faithful tithe and offering just that one moment, you, that one month, you ain't desperate enough. Because see, there's some other stuff that's got to fail you so that you learn how to depend on the God who never fails. Listen, I'm done. But see, there's a reason that God can't let Naaman be a part of the process. Because, see, I need you to understand, friends of mine, that this is not about the healing of a body. See, all God has got to do is snap his fingers or speak a word and he'll be healed. But God is trying to facilitate something way greater. He's got a condition that he can't heal. He can't buy his way out of it. He can't work his way out of it. He can't self-improve his way out of it. It's got to be the work of God alone. Are y'all hearing me, saints? And he's trying to show us something that we got a condition to. No, it ain't on your skin. But it's on the, every portion of the inside of you. And the only way you're going to overcome it, friends of mine, you can't talk your way out of it. You can't work your way out of your condition. You can't give your way out of your condition. It is the work of God alone in your life. So he says, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times. And it's crazy because I think when he does this, he literally combines two miracles. So, so think about the Jordan River, what happened there? Remember, God opened up the Jordan. Remember, the Jordan was the last barrier to the promised land. And there was a reason God opened up the Jordan so that God's people would know they have access to the promised land whenever they go there. And so he sends this leper that can't clean himself and can't fix himself and can't improve himself to the Jordan because when he's in the Jordan, it's a reminder that he's got access to the promised land. But remember, on the other side of the Jordan was a city called Jericho. And then they had to march around Jericho seven times. And then they had to go seven times on the seventh day. And on the seventh time, guess what? The walls came tumbling down. So guess what? It didn't happen on the first time or the second time. There was nothing that changed until they went around and they couldn't find rest until they did it the seventh time. So guess what? He's in the water that represents access. But then there's got to be a perseverance because he goes down one time. It's still there. Two times, it's still there. Three times, it's still there. Four times, it's still there. But guess what? As he's watching, he's looking at Jericho. Five times, it's still there. Six times, it's still there. And just like the walls came tumbling down, 
after the seventh time. When he comes up out of the water the seventh time, all the scales start falling off his arms and all of the scores begin to fall off and he's able to find his rest after the perfect number seven. And God is saying to somebody today that I want you to pass through the waters that let you know you've got access to the promised land. And I want you to start keeping my seventh day Sabbath, which is a reminder that when you rest in me, everything that binds you and holds you and keeps you, it's all going to come tumbling down when you find your rest in him. And so, friends of mine, I need you to understand that there's nothing wrong with having a preference. But see, the question for somebody today, have you gotten to a place where your preference is so rigid that your preference is actually greater than your faith? To where because it's not happening the way you thought it was going to happen, or it's not, do, it's not coming as soon as you thought it was going to come, or because God didn't start the business or help you close on the house or get you married in the way you thought you were gonna it was going to happen. You got to get to a place where you recognize, Lord, I, I'm cool. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And your ways are not my ways. And I believe for you to do it, but I'm not going to try to dictate how you do it. And I'm just out of place where I just say, Lord, any way you bless me. I'll be satisfied. Have thy own way, Lord. Have thy own way. are the potter and I am the clay Lord I need you to mold me and shape me after thy While I am waiting, yielded and still. Can I say it again one more time? Come on, you got to feel it. It says, have thine own way. thine own way Lord you are the potter and I am the clay please mold me and shape me after There's another song in there, it says, I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh,
And I thank you, Jesus, because he has done great things. I call this victory over my life because he has done great things. Oh, oh he, he has done great things. I will bless his holy name. If you want to proclaim the victory this morning, open up and sing with us. He has done great things together. Say, He has done great things come on stand and proclaim it this morning say he has done he has done great things if you believe it say he has he has done his holy his holy name hallelujah hallelujah the hour is late but I'm hoping that you heard what the spirit was saying to the church today how many of us are believing God for something today maybe you're praying for the salvation of a child the restoration of a marriage, the healing of a body, the completion of an education, the fulfillment of a vision. And guess what? You ought to believe God for it with your whole heart. But don't try to pin God in a box into the how he's going to do it. You got to get to a place where your preference is not outweighing your faith. But you just say, Lord, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. You know, there was another reason that Naaman didn't want to go into the Jordan. Because to go into the Jordan, he would have to go out and walk down in front of people. He didn't want people to know he had an issue. He didn't want folk to know he needed help there was a fear that paralyzed him and tried to restrain him from the one thing that was going to change his life. And some of us, somebody today is about to give deuces to the moment that's going to change your life because you don't want to have to come down in front and acknowledge you need a, need a savior. But let me be clear. No matter how many suits and ties and long dresses, you know why we all in here today? We are all here because at some point we recognize we needed a savior. You in good company today. And there is somebody today that like Naaman that needs to be immersed not in the Jordan River, but you need to be taken down in the water of baptism for the remission of your sins. You need to say goodbye to the old life and like Naaman, you need to begin a new life in Jesus Christ. And there's somebody today, you've been thinking about it for some time, you've been contemplating it for a little while, but for whatever reason, you were nervous, you were anxious, you were, you were concerned with what somebody was going to have to say. But I need you to know that Naaman had to get so desperate that people's opinions, what they thought, their considerations did not matter to him. He was going to go down even if he had to go all by himself. And so today, if there's somebody who needs to make a decision to receive Jesus Christ, I need you to understand you receive him in your heart but the outward demonstration is you're baptized for the remission of your sins 
And there's somebody today who needs to say, I know what I need to do. Spirit of God has been moving upon my heart. And today, you want to receive Jesus. So whether you're in the balcony, whether you're on the floor, you want to say yes to the Lord and Savior. Just step out of your aisle. Come on down to the front. Give me your hand and give Jesus your heart. There is somebody today that, like the song says, you want to surrender all. Like, like the song says, you want to give your whole self to Jesus Christ. So as the Spirit of God is moving heavily upon you, I invite you into open fellowship with the Savior. Just tell your neighbor, excuse me, come on down to the front, give me your hand, give Jesus your heart today. I need you to know this is your day. This is your hour. This is your moment. The doors of the church is open. Come on in. God bless you, brothers. Praise God. Welcome to his family. Welcome to his house. You belong here. You belong here. God bless you, my friend. Hallelujah. God bless you, my friend. God bless you, my brother. Yeah, yeah, you've been coming for a little while. God bless you, my friend. Is there somebody else today? You want to say yes to Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? You want to say, I want to join the family of God. I want to be numbered with the righteous. And so in just these next few moments, you want to say yes to the Lord. Whether you're in the balcony, you're a student, this last Sabbath of the new year, whether you're on the floor, maybe you're a little child and you've been wanting to be baptized. God bless you, mom and son. Thank you for coming down. God bless you today. Is there somebody else today that wants to make a decision to follow after Jesus? Great decision, little man. God bless you. Is there somebody else? Maybe you're eight. Maybe you're 10. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you're a young adult. Maybe you got some gray, maybe you got some bald, but you know what you need to do. And if this is the day you want to begin your journey with Jesus, it's okay to come out in the open. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. And Jesus wants to confess you. He wants to take ownership of you as soon as you have the courage to step out and lay, take ownership of him. So today if you're here, I want to pray, I want to close, but I just want to give one last person, one last family, one last group, an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. I see you coming. God bless you. Putting our hands together, encouraging, cheering you on to Jesus Christ. God bless you. Great decisions, little ones. God bless you. Way to go, mom. God bless you, little man. Best decision you will ever make. Thank you, buddy. God bless you, little lady. Is there somebody else today? You want to give Jesus your heart? You want to say yes to his will, yes to his way, yes to his direction. We're going to close in just a moment. We just want to give one last person, one last individual, one last family this opportunity to say yes. I want you to know, friends of mine, the resistance you feel, that that's something in you that's pressing you. I need you to know that is an invisible resistance that is from your enemy. He fears the decision you're about to make. He knows if you ever get free, that you, he will not be able to hold you in permanence. But God woke me up early this morning to begin mighty intercession, that the chains would fall off, that the bands of iniquity would be loose, and that you would become God's freed man or freed woman today. So today in Jesus' name, you are released, you're free, just walk in it today wherever you are, man, woman, boy, girl. And even as I'm praying this prayer, you can still come. The doors of the church are open. Why don't you come on in? Right now we're praying. Father in heaven, our prayer is simply this. Have thine own way. Have thine own way. We recognize that you are the potter and we are the clay. Lord, some of your people have some unrealistic faith. They are trusting you for big things that are beyond human imagination. But what we're simply covenanting to do today is to just take on a posture of flexibility that says, Lord, we're not going to try to dictate the terms. We're not going to try to dictate the timing. We're not going to try to dictate the context. We're simply going to function in obedience and in willingness. And however you do it, Lord, we'll be satisfied. 
So Lord, we, we throw out our preference. Lord, we remove our narrative from the equation. And we just give you permission to move. Lord, we just surrender all. We yield it all over to you. Do what you must. Do what you will. Most, most importantly, Lord, do what's best. So Lord, bless us to this end. We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Let those that believe shout amen and hallelujah today. To those who came down, God bless you. Just follow Sister Perry out. She's going to give you some direction, wants to give you some information about the next step of your discipleship. Mom, you want to come with her? Um, let's put our hands together for all of those who came down to say yes to Jesus Christ today. God bless you. And then we want to encourage those of you who are watching online. Listen, listen, if you wanted to make a decision online, you can email us uh, at info, dot o, uh, info at ouc.org. And then we want to encourage you after the benediction, stay by in the Praise Cafe. Some important announcements about what's coming, going on this afternoon for our children, uh, this evening, and some things that are coming up in the coming weeks. So make sure you stay on important information we want to share with you. God bless you. Amen, amen. Let us give Pastor Snell a hand clap of praise for that wonderful word today. Has everyone been blessed today by the word of God? Amen. Let us all stand up on our feet and receive the benediction today. God, our Father, Lord, we say thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard. So, O oh God, as we leave this place, help us, O oh God, never to leave your presence. O oh God, we're asking that the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide within us. In our going out and in our coming in, oh God, Lord, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to guide us throughout the rest of this day. God, we're asking that you will keep us safe from any hurt, harm, or danger. And we will be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. So, oh God, we ask that you will shine your face upon us. Give us peace, oh God. And this is our prayer, this is our goal, and this is our aim. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. You may be seated now for a moment of meditation. Sermon. Yes. yes, Pastor Snell is on fire as always. Yes, 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 and that preference being greater, wow. So uh, I, I thank God uh, for the message that he gave. Yes, and, uh, it was for a some of us message. who are working through this, that our preference may be greater than our faith. And yes. uh, we've got some hashtags to go with that, don't we? We do. We have some hashtags that really stood out. Yeah. So um, one of them is custom experience. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have our um, want a custom experience with God Hashtag. so that it can be tailored to us. Yes. Um, also, intrinsic value. Hashtag intrinsic yes. value. Um, hashtag uh, have it. Have you ever? However you do it, That's right. however you however do it, Lord, do it. just do it mm -hmm. for us. Yes. <laughs> and then one. emptied vault, mm -hmm. empty the vault. So yes. those are some hashtags for today. So make sure yes. you put them in the chat for us today. Yes. Yes. And you know, as we go through this Sabbath day, as this Sabbath, these Sabbath hours, you can just think about it. Lord, you know, what preference do I have that I'm placing that's greater than my faith over you? Well, when I think of preferences, mm -hmm. babe, I think of wants. Okay. What do I want? That's it. That's and it. I'm placing that over what God mm -hmm. wants or wants for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And in those wants, we can find ourselves bogged down and just uh, lose ourselves in that. Yes, mm -hmm. we can. 
and 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 also just to kind of piggyback of what you're saying you know yes. for for our online viewers you know and listening to what pastor snell is saying you know we want our preferences um we want what god wants for us and not our own preferences because we know that in our humanness mm -hmm. is not our preferences mm -hmm. are not maybe what god wants us to have yeah that is true and you know as i listened to the sermon today i was thinking about some of the things that uh pastor snell said and just those two servants yes. that stood out to me. The yes. first servant girl who gave the message of a healer. Yes. And then that was the servant that was taken from her home. And then that second servant who was a servant of Naaman, yes. who said, hey man, turn around. You know? Turn around. Don't turn be around. too angry. You know? Yes. Listen to what was said to you. And that's amazing because you know, it, we don't know how much of a connection he had with God. Right. We do know the servant girl had it because yes. she understood who Elisha was. But that one servant of Naaman, isn't that awesome? Awesome. It's very awesome. Yes. Not to lose, the, not to lose sight where his healing was going to come from. Not to lose it. And, and Naaman obviously had preferences mm -hmm. versus um, what God had in store for him, for mm -hmm. his healing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we have to. It's what God wants for us and not our preferences. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm thankful for all of that. It, it really yes, fed me. Yes. And, you know, I usually have to go get my front row seat, you know. And, and you I, did. I, and I, you did. I, I slide out of the cafe. <laughs> I go get my front row seat so I can, you know, praise with him. You know, I bring my blessing to church like we all should. And I just have a real good time out there in the front. And I'm hoping you have yes. a real good time at home. <laughs> yes, because here in the cafe and church yes. at OUC we're having a good time especially when you're in person and you're able to sit here and see Pastor Snell bring the word that God has so graciously given him yes, yes. and so um, if you're interested in joining Oakwood University Church please if you're interested in baptism transfer of members yes, we do outs. have some more birthday yes, shout yes. outs so you, you oh yes birthdays? we have Cicely Thomas okay we also have Brenda Williams we have Oscar Crenshaw, <laughs> Teresa Woods, Eve Cargill, our very own, Kayla Cartwright, Garland Doolin, and Tamisha Harrell. So those are some other additional birthdays that we mm -hmm. wanted to shout out. And again, if we've missed anyone, please make sure to put that in the chat. And our OUC community will definitely celebrate you. Yeah, yeah, two of our elders, Yvette Cargill and, yes. and, and Garland Doolin. We just want to say happy birthday to you all. But we okay. have a special guest that's yes. going to be with us today that's uh, uh, soon to join to us, right who is going to share some important information. We've got a big weekend going on, and this weekend is the Tennessee Valley Youth Federation, and I'm being joined by Tanya Bowman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pat. Brother yeah. Till. I want to call you okay. Pastor Till. Hey, it's all right. All it's right. all right. You do yes, so yes. much amazing work here at Oakwood University <laughs> Church. Thank you. Thank you. And all you guys right. do an amazing work with our youth. And uh, in our conference, uh, she's going to share some things with us that's happening today. All right. So, mm -hmm. um, long from now, mm -hmm. probably around 3.15 is when we want to start. We're going to be having um, one of our federation events okay. with okay. our young people. Mm -hmm. um, we are tired of being locked up. All right, COVID has kept um, a lot of our events that we've done mm -hmm. for our youth yes. um, kind of online. Okay. All right, okay. so we've had maybe two. This will be our third event that we're having um, outside, and it's going to be right here at Oakwood University Church, oh. so you don't have to go far. Mm -hmm. All right, so starting at 315, we're looking for all of our youth Okay. starting with ages 12 and up, but this time we're even having children activities. Oh, awesome. So children as young as four years old, come on out, come on out, bring mm. your lunches. If you have to run home, you don't have to stop and eat, just grab it, okay. bring your lawn chairs, okay. and we're just gonna have an awesome time out there on the lawn, have some mm -hmm. good music, some okay. good fellowship, some good Christian games, and then um, at 5.30, okay. it's not over. We're gonna come inside the church, okay. and then uh, Pastor Mann, our youth, mm. um, a leader Kimberly at Mann. our South Central okay. Conference. She's going to be with us at 530. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're going to have our teens and our young adults right here in the auditorium. And we're going to do okay. some views from the balcony. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Sister uh, Bowman, can you tell us, is there a registration or do we show up? How do we do it? Mm -hmm. You just show up. Oh, well, that actually, is awesome. we do have a registration. Very short, very short. Mm -hmm. You just um, give us your name, just two or three other items. Okay. Um, for our children, though, we do want our parents to come register our children. Mm -hmm. And if they're four or five years old, you stay with the children. Okay. We have some good refreshments. 
out there for you guys also to enjoy with your lunch. All right, y'all heard that. Four and five year olds keep parents with them or some guardian. Yep. This is not necessarily daycare for a couple hours, <laughs> but it is child care, meaning we want to give your children something that's going to bless them and even bless you and your family. So we're talking about ages four, I'm sorry, yeah, four to 12. Awesome, awesome. So today. And then 13 to 18. 13 also, we to 18. have separate things for our teens. Okay. So we're going to start outside and then we're going to move inside. Absolutely. Well, I am thankful for that. And we thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. And we will see you later on this afternoon with the Tennessee Valley Youth Federation from our South Central Conference. Thank you so much, Sister Bowman. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So. Uh, you guys heard that. That's one of the announcements. That's one of the events that are going coming. And uh, South Central is actually having a town hall meeting later on this evening as well that you are welcome to join us. So as we go through this uh, Sabbath day, we've got some events for you that's going to take you all the way through to sunset, right? And even after sunset, we've got our town hall meeting for you guys for you to be able to enjoy. And don't forget, we still have our unrealistic series going on. We're going to meet tomorrow. Pastor Snell will uh, be with us at 8 a.m. So you want to join us at 8 a.m. for our unrealistic series. And oh, hey, hey. join us again. We here, we here. Yes. How yes, you feeling, yes, man? Yes, man. <laughs> I am feeling good. Yes, I am sir. feeling good. Yeah. good. God bless you, man. man. You Diddy. and Nicole, y'all been filling up this space <laughs> wonderfully. Wonderfully. Yeah. But you, you know, uh, actually, she was going to interview you today. Okay. But, it, you know, providence has happened that yeah. it's you and me. Hey, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> but, man. I sure appreciate what you brought to us. Man, thank you, man. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just praising God, man. It mm -hmm. was, it's been so heavy yes. in my soul this mm -hmm. week, man. Mm -hmm. my, my feet felt like uh, they were like 10,000 pounds yes. until I started preaching. I needed to get that burden off mm -hmm. of me mm -hmm. because like, this was, I think, one of the nexus messages mm -hmm. in this whole mm -hmm. series mm -hmm. because I think that um, one of the things that happens is we form these narratives like mm -hmm. Naaman in our yes. mind. Yes. Like he, he had that thing, whole, uh, a whole yes. script laid yes. out. Yes. You know, I'm going to come in, he's going to come wave his hand, pray, <laughs> and I'm just going to get well. But like, you know how the other folk would say, if you want to make God laugh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell him your plans. Yes. And, and, and there's a Bible verse that I think is critical for this, mm -hmm. where when the book of Proverbs, it says, in a man's heart, he mm -hmm. plans his course. Yes. But it is the Lord that determines his steps. Yes. And see, this is the thing I want somebody to understand because, like, we all have this way that, and I know you didn't even asked me a question. Mm -hmm. I'm just going all the way. It's all right. Like, we Let have this way you. we thought we were going to meet our spouse. Yes. Or we had this narrative of how we were going to get the house. Mm -hmm. We had this narrative. Like, there are a lot of praying parents. You have this narrative for how your child is going to be saved. Mm -hmm. There's some of us that have this narrative of how the ministry is going to grow. Mm -hmm. But, like, one of the things I'm just learning is that, and Ellen White talks about this. She talks about, how God has a thousand ways, thousand ways of providing for us mm -hmm. that we know not of. Wow. And see, the problem is God has a thousand ways, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but we're only willing to receive a single way. Mm. When God That's has, word, God has 999 mm. other options, mm -hmm. 999 <laughs> other particular ways that we, he's going to do it. But really what it's about, it's about how is his name going to be glorified? Mm. And, and it's funny because there's certain things I left out of the message and Holy mm -hmm, Spirit's bringing mm -hmm. to my heart. This is one thing about a, any believer, anybody that's going to walk in unrealistic faith, and I want you to hear me. Yes. A part of your life, or one of the things you've got to give God the permission to do, mm -hmm. is say, Lord, would you get the glory from my mm. life by any means necessary? Mm. So that when you look at certain things in the Bible, I'm thinking about the book of John, yes. where there was a, a man who was sick. Mm -hmm. The disciples asked him, who sinned? This mm -hmm. man or his parents. Yes. And he was like, nobody said. He, I mean, he was a baby. I mean, yeah. he was a, <laughs> him or his parents. Yes. But he says this was for the glory of God. Glory so the of glory God. of God might be revealed. Or even with Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, he literally says, it was good for you that I was not here. Yes. But he says, I, I let Lazarus die mm. so that the glory of God glory. might be revealed. Mm -hmm. And so there's a part of us that has to say, okay, Lord, I, I give you permission, mm -hmm. uh, I, I give consent for you to get the glory from my life, mm -hmm. however you choose to use your glory as a compass mm -hmm. to direct people to the path of salvation. Mm -hmm. And see, the problem is you'll never have this unrealistic experience 
as long as you're trying to manipulate the way the glory of God is revealed mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. If you only accept God under certain terms. Mm -hmm. You see, you can't give God no conditions. <laughs> I mean, like, we ain't got no bargaining power oh, yes. with God. Yes. I mean, listen, God cannot wait. You really, he ain't got nothing but time mm -hmm. and eternity. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, and I thought the appeal song was so appropriate, mm -hmm. where it's, you know, it's that old hymn, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. But this is the key. Thou art the potter. Mm -hmm. I am the clay. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we confuse the roles. Mm -hmm. He is potter. Mm -hmm. We are clay. Mm -hmm. He is creator. We are creation. Created. Yes. And I think that there's, some, there's something about the power of choice mm -hmm. that kind of feels, that makes us think we have a little more say in providence than we mm -hmm. actually do. Well, you know, you kind of already went into one of my questions okay. because, you know, the title of your sermon is your preference greater than your faith. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to ask you, preacher, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was what if my preference is greater than my faith? How do I work through that? Mm -hmm. And you kind of already given us some tea, some some tools mm -hmm. and keys to success, but I, yeah. it might, I know it's something else in you with that question. So remember, so if I can give just a verse for this, okay. Proverbs 3, 5, we all know it, trust in the Lord mm -hmm. with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. That's a good word. But in all your ways, acknowledge him yes. and he will direct your path. But see, this is the thing, if I can just, I think I said it, maybe I didn't, but I want to just emphasize mm -hmm. it. Um, there's a statement in the book, Education. Higher than the highest human thought can conceive wow. is God's ideal for his children. That's and see, this thing, so like even when we talk about your preference, remember mm -hmm. how we just kind of broke it up, not e e uh, etymology, uh, etym uh, it's not the perfect etym uh, etymology, yes. but pre-reference. Mm -hmm. Pre-reference. In other words, I'm referencing something mm -hmm. that I've previously seen or been exposed to. Mm -hmm. But remember, God's plans for you exceed what you can imagine. Mm. His purposes for you exceed what you can even think. So, like, even your highest perception of what God can do, mm. multiply it times 10, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's still going to fall short wow. of what God <laughs> ultimately has designed for you. <laughs> wow. And see, and this is where the unrealistic portion mm -hmm. comes in because, see, like, See, see, the problem with preference is it's, it's limiting. Okay. It's binding you to mm -hmm. what you've already had, mm -hmm. experienced, or been exposed mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Where God wants to take you, but you've never seen, what, yes. you, what you've never experienced. Yes. And so that's what Naaman was doing. Mm -hmm. He was trying to limit, him, limit uh, God to the work of a common witch doctor mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. to what he had seen in the rivers in, of Damascus. Mm -hmm. But God is saying, no, I got something you've never seen something that's going to completely blow your mind. Yeah, and you are, what, what you're saying is mind-blowing because if I can't even imagine yeah. what God has for me, that's right. that I'm already messed up. I'm You're at a loss, up. preacher. That's right. I'm at a loss. So you, right. you just said unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So what if I feel like serving God is just too unrealistic? <laughs> well, I mean, listen. So the, remember the whole thesis of the book is mm -hmm. this. Like, so this is the thing, and, and this is, it's funny because one of the things about faith mm -hmm. is you will have to get to a point in your faith <laughs> where you either believe God can do anything wow. or you just got to stop believing. Oh, Lord. Like, see, there's nothing, yes. like, even the whole idea of partial faith, mm. that don't even make sense. Mm -hmm. Or even creating a threshold that says, I'm going to believe to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why bother? Wow. You see what I'm saying? Why even bother with the principle of faith? Mm. Like, I mean, it, so if you're not going to max it out, mm -hmm. it, it really can't satisfy you. Mm -hmm. It really can't bring full joy. You can't reach your full capacity until you max it all the way out. Yes. It's, it's like a ball. It won't bounce if it just has a little bit of air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. a balloon won't float if it's just partially filled. Yes. And it's kind of the same thing with faith. Until you max it all the way you out. Max it out. You're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. It's an exercise in futility. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get to this place, friends, where either you're going to trust him for everything mm -hmm. Or just go atheist. Mm -hmm. Like anything in between, it doesn't right. really make sense. Stepping on some toes. Oh, well, just, <laughs> it, it just is what it is. Yes. So unless there is a progression. You're right. So like some of us are at this place in our faith. Some of mm -hmm. us are at another place in our faith. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be a progression as I am stretching to the mm -hmm. full capacity mm -hmm. of faith. Mm -hmm. And see, this thing, remember we, we said it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. You only got to start with a mustard seed. That's it. A mustard seed will move the mountain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A mustard seed will, will turn that which is upside down, right side up. Yes. But you got to begin even with mustard seed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, 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 and like that video, uh, mm -hmm. the, the testimony of it, not those yellow ones. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That black that one. Black, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, the yeah, black, yeah, one, that right. black And, you know, it's amazing what you said 
it, it, we should put that as a hashtag. Mm-hmm. Max it out. Max it out. Yeah, hashtag, you know, <laughs> max it all the way. <laughs> out. You know, because if I had a credit card, you yeah. know, well, they accidentally gave me a credit card as a freshman yeah. here at Oakland, <laughs> and I said I'm gonna try my hardest yeah. to max that max thing it out. out. And I it. did. That's but it. we cannot max out yeah. God's goodness. You can't max gra- out His goodness. That's Man. right. And so I can't even imagine. It, listen, that. it's like having a Lamborghini. Yeah. That you drive 30 miles an hour. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it's it's built to do so much more. Mm-hmm. Faith is designed to open so many Stretch. more doors, move us in so many different paths. Mm-hmm. And, and they're all about not just our pleasures, our mm-hmm. preferences, but mm-hmm. it's about the glory of God. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And, you know, I just want to be in God's way. So yeah. one more question. Yep. So with this thing, we talked about unrealistic. Uh, how can we get to the place where we can operate in this mentality, this ideology? Because mm-hmm. I want to max it out. Yeah. So, so getting to that place. Yeah. So this is one of the things I, I noticed, and, I, and, I, and I've said it a couple of times, but I think it bears repeating. Mm-hmm. I think every, every day you have to make the decision okay. to not go back to your default settings. Mm. Like, like you, know, every, you know, like your television, your, they have default settings so that if there's any kind of trauma or anything, it's just going to automatically default to this. Mm-hmm. Every day you have to make the decision to walk in faith. Yeah. To, to, to not walk by faith, but walk, not to walk by sight, but to walk by faith. That is a decision that has to be made. And there are certain sermons you got to preach to yourself mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. There are certain scriptures that need to be committed to mis- memory. 11, Hebrews 11.6, 11, mm-hmm. without faith, it is impossible to please God. Mm-hmm. He that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. Mm-hmm. So I think repetition deepens the impression. And practice doesn't make permanent, perfect. But when they say practice makes permanent, wow. doesn't make it perfect, but yes. it makes it permanent. Yes. And what you need is these principles to become hardwired mm-hmm. in your soul. Mm-hmm. So, so you're telling me when we see these professionals who do what they do, mm-hmm. practice, 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 yep. practice. Yep. Well, this, is such, this has been an awesome Sabbath, mm-hmm. and we thank you, Pastor, thank for you, what you, you shared with us. If I could just kind of throw yes. out there, listen, if, if this is blessing you, yes. if, if what we shared today, today's experience helped you in any way, uh, we ask you to do one of three things. Like, one, we just need you to be that Apple apostle. We need mm-hmm. you to share, share, share. If you're on Facebook, share, share. If yes. you're on YouTube, copy that link. Send it to somebody. If you know how to do it, ask your grandchild, grandson, granddaughter. They will help you out. Uh, we ask for your prayers. And then we just ask that if you, would, uh, if you would give a gift to the Breath of Life ministry, it just allows us to fill up the airwaves and the internet streams with the glad tidings of salvation. These are the ways you can give. Like, right now, you can, you can go online and give at breathoflife.tv. You can give by mail at Breath of Life, P.O. Box 5960, Huntsville, Alabama, 35814. You can give by phone, 256-929-6460. Right now, listen, you ain't got to wait till tomorrow. Like, this is not breaking the Sabbath. <laughs> right now, you can give on Cash App, dollar sign, Breath of Life TV. Or you can give through text, give three, B-O-L TV. And all this does, everything you give, it goes right back into the ministry so we can extend our reach across the globe with the glad tidings of salvation. Mm. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Have an unrealistic week. Listen, don't forget to pray unrealistic prayers. Mm-hmm. Make room for the supernatural things that you prayed for to come yes. to pass. Don't be logical in your faith. Mm. and Don't be linear in your faith. Don't be realistic in your faith. Get some unreality. This yes, week. yes, that's a good word. Yeah. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath day and this Sabbath rest. And we ask, Lord, that we become more unrealistic in our faith and our move toward you because we don't, we can't even understand what you have for us because your ways are not our ways. Yes. We thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 God yes. bless you. Yes.